Tom, the first time we spoke, we covered so many different topics and your theory of everything is very fascinating. Before we start, I mean, this time we're going to go into a lot of the practical significance and, and what it can open the doors to. Uh, before we begin, though, would you like to just give a brief summary of what we discussed? I'll definitely put a link to that three hour plus conversation below as well. Okay. Well, let me uh, uh, say to your listeners that if they haven't listened to what we did last time, which means you're, you're what do we call that, round one or, mm. or uh, whatever, uh, if they haven't listened to that, they really need to listen to that first mm. because we're not going to go back through all of that uh, defining bas the basics of the model because mm -hmm. that, that took us, what, uh, three hours or something yeah, but last time? Hours. Yeah, so we're not going to do all that again. So if, if you hear things that we say today that just don't seem to make sense, they seem to be kind of off the wall, it's because you missed, you know, something that, that would explain them and make them, them seem uh, rational and logical. Mm -hmm. So don't just throw it away if you, if you uh, uh, don't quite understand, you know, where we're coming from or if we sound like we're making things up. <laughs> it really does have a logical foundation underneath of it. So yeah. I tell that to your readers, a, a very short summary of the model is that it's based on an assumption that consciousness exists. And that's really the only assumption that I have. Hmm. Consciousness exists. Now, the model, uh, and what I do to make the model is I start with the, with the simplest form of consciousness, which would consciousness I define as awareness with a choice. Okay, so a simplest awareness with a choice would be an awareness that could decide whether it was in state A or state B. Because it was only in state A, then it wouldn't have any choice. But because there's two states, it's got a choice. It can be in state one or state two or A or B or one or zero, you know, however you want to, to say that. So that defines the smallest piece of consciousness is awareness with a choice. It only has two choices, one or two. And from that, we let it evolve. And how does consciousness evolve? It evolves by lowering its entropy. Consciousness is an information system. What you're conscious of, what you're aware of, you know, you're aware of things and then you get to make choices, right? So what you're aware of is the data your five senses gives to you. Close off all your five senses and you are just aware only that you exist. You're aware that you're aware and nothing else. You can't see, hear, smell, taste, feel, anything else. So all of that awareness that you have is basically a data, you know, is data that you get from your senses. Your senses are just data collectors and your body is a data sensor platform, right? So we, get to, we come to the conclusion that consciousness is really an information system. It's about information. Think of an information system where all the, um, all the bits in it are all random. You know, random ones, random zeros, if you want to think in terms of binary, uh, like our computers. So they're all, they're all random. Well, if they're random, there is no information. That's the very definition of no information is that everything's random. Randomness carries no information. So the way you create information is by ordering some of those bits. And then that order, whatever that ordering is, that ordering then can stand for something. It can be, you know, a symbol for something else. You know, it, you can build on that. It could just be a number, number one, the number two, you know, the number six, the ordering is, uh, just something that the system finds interesting. And the more order it can produce within that randomness, the more information there is. So how does an information system evolve? It evolves by lowering entropy because entropy is a measure of disorder. So when you start with random and you order it, you're lowering the entropy. So that's a, that's a big part of this theory that you have to understand. So this consciousness system now is going to evolve. And if it can have two states, well, it can have series of states. It can have a, a one and a one, and then a zero and a zero, or a one and a zero and a one and a zero, or it can make up as much as that it, as it needs. Because if it's aware, that means also that it has memory. 
it's aware of things and not just this moment and nothing else ever. It's a, you know, it's a, it's aware of things, uh, as time goes by. So it has memory. So now it can make any kind of strings of ones and zeros, you know, with it's within its memory. Okay. Now it, uh, it's evolving further and it, it runs into lots of patterns of patterns of, and it, it, it creates time by taking a one and a zero and just alternating that one, zero, one, zero, one, zero regularly. And that call, that's called a metronome and it, it creates time. It, well, it, I shouldn't say that way. Time's already there, but it creates regular time. You know, not just kind of prior normal time that things change somehow or sometime, but prior, you know, ordered time, regular time that's measured in feet, zero, one, zero, one. So once it has regular time, it can also make sequences. Eventually, it runs out of uh, uh, its evolutionary space because it's just one monolithic thing. The solution is break itself into pieces. Those pieces are you and I. We're just pieces of this larger consciousness system, LCS. I call it larger consciousness system. So we're just a subset, a virtual machine inside a big mainframe, if you like. Okay, so that's who we are. And we all have free will, because if we didn't have free will, then there wouldn't be any point in breaking it apart. <laughs> you just break into a bunch of parts that are exactly, you know, there's no new information there. But if you give each part free will, now you have a bunch of independent players. And when you have a bunch of independent players, what they can do together, what they can create together is much bigger than what just one player is going to create by themselves. One player is limited to just what that one player can think of. Lots of players can think of different things. And eventually, as time goes on, all these players end up very different from each other. It spreads because their experiences are not exactly the same. Therefore, they're not exactly the same, which means they start looking at issues from different angles from different points of view which is then valuable in what the whole can create all right so that's basically the system um we are in individuated units of consciousness one of those individual piece the system was not uh again i had another plateau let's put it that way had another plateau of growing up mm -hmm. so it it needed a a better, more consequential virtual reality. It created the first virtual reality, which was just communication protocols. Okay, and so it could communicate with its little, you know, individuated units, and they could communicate with each other. And that was a virtual reality. A virtual reality in an information system is basically a rule set. If you define a rule set, and you can define initial conditions too if you want, but if you define an, a rule set, that f forms a virtual reality. Everybody that's in that virtual reality has to abide by that rule set. First virtual reality, communication protocols. Next virtual reality had to be something that was more than just a big chat room, which is what they had with the first virtual reality was this monster chat room. So that you can't grow very much with that. The choices you make don't matter a whole lot. So now, what do we mean? What is it about these choices? Well, the choices you make will reflect that quality of your consciousness, which is the same as that level of entropy of your consciousness. So you need to make choices that lower the entropy of your consciousness because the whole system is evolving by lowering you know, the entropy of its consciousness. Indeed, that's why we're here, because we're part of the system strategy for lowering its own entropy. That's why it had to create us. Okay. So then here we are, you and I, Tev and Tom, and we are avatars, our bodies are avatars. Mm -hmm. Our consciousness is the player, is a piece of consciousness, an individuated unit of consciousness who is playing this human avatar. The human avatar is this next you know, it represents this next virtual reality I was talking about. Okay, how does how does that happen? Does the system program a big virtual reality like ours? 
no, that's way too hard, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't hold together. It wouldn't be consistent if it was just programmed. So it's evolved. It started with a set of initial conditions, and you'll you'll kind of see the big bang in this. A set of initial conditions, which is a ball of plasma, you know, high pressure, high temperatures, a rule set like gravitation and and you know forces and so on. The rule set we call physics, basic physics. Then it punches the run button and lets the initial conditions change according to the rule set. And then it just lets that go and evolve however it does, and we end up with our universe and eventually us. And the whole point of this was to provide a new virtual reality where consciousness had more consequential choices, choices that would help it lower its entropy by bigger steps than just the tiny little steps that it was able to get out of a big chat room. So that was the point of it. And then we, uh, we individuated units of consciousness, we, we partition off a piece of ourself, which I call a free will awareness unit. And that's the piece that logs on to play a human that has evolved inside this big virtual reality that, that the system has evolved for us to play in and make choices in. All right, now, as everybody knows, the choices we have here aren't trivial. You know, these choices are life and death and very important to us. You know, we, we uh, you know, have spouses, we have children, you know, we have to eat, we need to find shelter. There's things that are are very critical to us even existing there and not and not uh, dying and therefore being th thrown out of the virtual reality. So here we are, pieces of consciousness. You know, my individuated unit of consciousness is basically having this conversation with your individuated unit of consciousness using two avatars. You know, your body, my body. So that's the way it works now. That's simple enough, but there are a lot of logical consequences of what I've just said. You know, there's, you can say, okay, I follow you. You know, consciousness is fundamental. Everything else is derived out of consciousness. Our reality, our universe, our physical universe is a virtual reality created by consciousness in order to serve the consciousness system's need for evolution. Because like anything, you can evolve and continue to evolve more, or you can de-evolve and eventually all your bits are random and you don't have an information system anymore. So it's basically evolve or die. You can't stay in the middle because that's, un that's unstable. You can't just hang in the middle between the two. You can dither around in the middle, but eventually you're going to end up de-evolving or evolving because the more you evolve, the easier it is to evolve more. The more you de-evolve, the easier it is to de-evolve more. Those two things are both slopes that you, that you slide down. So just trying to maintain a balance between them, well, maybe could do that for a while, but it's not a good long-term strategy. Eventually, you're going to end up on one slope or the other, and you know, you're, going to, you're, going to, you're going to either die or continue on. So the system wants to live. It wants to continue on. So that's another thing that motivates it so it wants to lower its entropy now lots of logical consequences which is what we're going to talk about today i think logical consequences so that only took me 15 minutes so that was good yeah no, <laughs> i did actually really i did actually really well there the funny thing tom is is that our conversation the last time was three and a half hours but we could have gone on for much longer i think the only thing that stopped us was the fact that i had to stop because it was past midnight and our time differences are so vast. So had that not been the case, I think we could have spoken for hours. It could have went on for five oh, hours. <laughs> sure, sure. This so is now we'll get into some of the, you know, the, the basically logical consequences. But let me just say the obvious one is that you know, consciousness is non-physical to this reality. Well, that's just the nature of a virtual reality. If you're an elf in the world of Warcraft, the computer that's computing that is non-physical to the elf, you know, to that world of Warcraft world, the, the, uh, the computer has to be someplace else. It can't be 
inside the world of Warcraft. You can't be part of that virtual reality. It has to be outside the virtual reality. And when it's outside the virtual reality, then if you're a character in the virtual reality, it's non-physical. And the player, which makes all the choices for the avatar, that too has to be you know, outside of the physical reality. So what that tells us is that consciousness is non-physical. This is a virtual reality. Uh, consciousness is the only thing that is fundamental, the only thing that's real, and information is the only thing that can create something real. Information and consciousness creates reality. Those two things together. Information given to a consciousness creates reality. Okay, and so then I would go on to say there's nothing more real than information. That's as real as it gets. Information, you know. So what are the consequences? Well, the, there's lots of consequences to this. Okay, so now we're two individuated units of consciousness, actually two free will awareness units, having a having a chat with each other, and this body only has to be only has to be rendered for you to see it and look and see that I'm here. It doesn't have to be rendered that there's oxygen in the room because you can't see oxygen. It doesn't have to be rendered that I have a brain or a heart or a circulatory system or a liver or anything else. None of that needs to be rendered. The only thing that has to be rendered is my exterior and your exterior and the motion, the things that we, we do. Okay, so the rendering isn't as big a problem as one might think. Like any other virtual reality, you only, you only render what the player can see or feel or, you know, smell or taste, you know, it, you've got your sensors. You only have to render what the other players can sense. Okay, so that's one thing. So our body is a virtual body. There is no brain, it's a virtual brain. The brain doesn't remember or process anything. The brain's not even rendered, you know, unless somebody cuts your head open, then it has to render a brain because now that's something you can see or smell and taste, you know, Ew, taste that that's gross. In, in anyway, a, the avatars of neurosurgeons probably see the most rendered brains in that case. Yes, they probably do. So none of those things are actually rendered. We are pieces of consciousness. Now that means that we're immortal. Consciousness doesn't die, body dies, but consciousness is the player. When your elf dies, you don't have to quit the game forever. You go get back in the game. Well, we do too. And the reason we have to get back in the game is evolving, lowering our entropy requires that we change who we are. We have to make ourselves a lower entropy being. It's not about our behavior. It's about who we are. It's not about acting kind, say, it's about being kind. And those two things are very different. So it's not easy. So when you drop out of the game because your body dies, uh, or you get run over by a truck or something happens, uh, well, you have to get back in the game. So you get another, you, your IUOC you know, takes that old partition down, reintegrates all that the part of that computer, puts a new partition down and starts to log on to some other being. And when it does that, it logs on with no intellectual data, only with the amount of quality of consciousness that, that that IUOC has learned up to that point. So the whole point of this game is to learn, to grow up, to lower your entropy. And I'll just, because we did it last time, I'll just say that we can logically show that the optimal way for a information, the optimal way for a, a social system to evolve, and we are a social system now. There's lots of us interacting with each other with free will. That optimal way is that those interactions be cooperative. That these interactions, those interactions, are based on caring, on helping, on you know positive things, not negative things. So I call that the love side. So our whole point of being here in this, in this virtual reality is to lower our entropy. And the way we do that is to care about each other, to cooperate, to connect. And yes, that's not just me trying to feel warm and fuzzy. That is a logical 
conclusion. You know, it's one of those one of those logical uh, conclusions from what I I told you. But you can find that in last time's stuff. We won't do that again. So that gives us purpose. What's our purpose here? It's to grow up. It's to lower our entropy, which means it's to become love, to care, to cooperate, to be, you know, ask the question, what can I do? How can I help? Rather than what's in it for me? And, you know, how can I get get the most by doing the least? You know, that's that's going the wrong way. That's on the fear side, which is the opposite of love is the is the fear side. It's not love versus hate. It's love versus fear. Hate is just a uh, an offshoot of of uh, fear. So in any case, uh, that's just one of the logical consequences. But I'm I'm pointing those out because they're kind of the big things, and we're going to get into the more detailed things later. So you are a piece of consciousness, and you are immortal, and you have multiple lifetimes, but each time. You only take your quality with you into that next life and not your intellect. And there's a lot of good logical reasons that it has to be that way. So uh, that's enough. I think we kind of have the basic thing. Who am I? Who are you? Why are we here? What the system was made of? And uh, and uh, we'll just start off fresh from, from that point. So let's so for, for all of those who need to watch that, they should. And then obviously read your book, your trilogy, Theory of Everything get a deeper understanding, and then you can come into this conversation with a bit more context. Now, this theory, unlike other idealists, um, you even mentioned Bernardo Castro, Donald Hoffman, etc. There are many idealists out there at this point, but mm -hmm. your, your theory, you're able to touch on topics that they tend to sway away from. And they don't like to talk about out-of-body experiences, near-death, um, sort of paranormal things. So anything that's considered paranormal in that, in that sense. This theory obviously allows you to touch on topics that they don't like to. And I think let's go through a lot of them. You already briefly touched on death and, and this process of almost like a reincarnation. You're just sort of rebooting into a mm -hmm. different avatar. Let's touch on what happens after death. And along those lines, how does your theory explain sort of reincarnation within this context and also near death experiences? Mm, okay. <laughs> um, well, Death is part of the rule set here. Remember, we had initial conditions and a rule set. And the way the rule set works is we grow old and the body dies. Or it's a dangerous place really to be. We may get, uh, you know, killed some other way. We may die some other way. You can get a disease. You can get, uh, you know, killed by force, whether it's being run over by something or whether you're in a fight or whatever. So the human body is going to die. And really, that's a good thing because what we're doing is trying to lower our entropy and grow. And as we get old, we kind of get that been there, done that attitude, and growing gets a little slower. We kind of get settled in our ways, and we think we know just about everything that there is to know. And we're happy with what we know, and we don't care much about what we don't know. And that means the learning kind of gets slower and slower and slower. So. What happens when that, you know, when you get an inefficiency like that is, well, you need to reboot. You need to say, well, okay, we've got enough out of that character. We're not going to get much more out of him. So let's go to another. Uh, because when you're very young, you're, you know, you're, you're very much open to everything because you don't know yet all the things that are impossible. So everything's kind of possible when you're young. And a lot of those things that your people will tell you are impossible really aren't impossible. It's, those are just beliefs that those people have, you see. That's how we make progress. You know, we grow. We do things that are better. So, okay, let's say you are an individual and your, your body dies. When your body dies, then that free will awareness unit is done, right? The free will awareness unit was just that piece of the individual unit of consciousness that was logged on to play all the choices for that body, make all the choices. So that free will awareness unit now, that partition comes down and it starts to reintegrate with the individual unit of consciousness. The individual itself, their awareness goes from I'm here, I'm alive to, oh, where am I? What's, what's going on? You find yourself not in the old reality anymore, but some other reality. At that point, 
there is another virtual reality called the transition reality. Now, I just made that name up because that's basically what it does. And that's a reality that's been designed to help people transition from one you know, experience to another. I call those experience packets, one experience packet to another experience packet. Other people call that reincarnation. I like to avoid all the words and terminology that has to do with anybody's religion or other ideas because you know, a lot of people hold those ideas real sacred. They get upset if you say things about them that they don't agree with, and it just creates a lot of trouble. So I make up my own terms. So we're talking about uh, experience packets that you, yeah. that you and have. Also, and just also another thing is I know you, you often say that you also don't want this to be entwined with theology. You want people to actually, you sometimes name these things, re relatively silly names. You sometimes like to actually do that on purpose. <laughs> yes, I do that on purpose so that people won't get that serious about it. I don't want to start a new theology. What I'd like to do is help correct an old theology. You know, that would be better. Um, I think that even though you don't want to start one, it's probably going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. I, I try very hard not to make that happen. Like you say, the, the uh, entity that's kind of in charge of this part of the, of the uh, non-physical space and consciousness, you know, I named him the big G's just because I thought that was funny enough that people wouldn't start to get down on their knees and, you know, pray to the big G's. It's just too silly to, to, to do that. So I, uh, I make up these names, but a lot of people uh, who do understand my big toe uh, very deeply, and they're also religious, then they do see the larger conscious system as God. And for them, it's like, wow, great, now I know really what God is and where God comes from. And so it, it solves a lot of problems for them because the, you know, the, the God thing is, is all kind of magic and, and uh, you know, assumptions. It, it doesn't have much solidity to it from a logical viewpoint. Well, now suddenly, it's logical and it makes sense. So there are people who you know think that the, the larger conscious system is God. Well, it is the Creator. We are a piece of it. You know, it, we're made in its image. We're a piece of consciousness. You know, you can fill in a lot of those those little blanks, and uh, it works rather well. So in any case, uh, people do that. I don't. I avoid the word God because again, it comes with all kinds of emotional energy. And there just isn't any point in ever arguing with emotion or arguing with believers. Those are arguments that, that uh, have no resolution and never converge. So there's just no point to have them. So I try to avoid them by not using words that will start those kind of arguments. So anyway, it's just the larger consciousness system. Now, I one time did sit down with... Uh, a couple of theologians, they both had their PhDs in theology, and I asked them to say, what are all the attributes of God? And you write them down, and they did. They wrote them all. They wrote down about six, seven things that they said were the attributes of God, and uh, all of those attributes applied directly to the larger consciousness system. Okay, But these attributes were not denominational. They weren't dogmatic things. They were just general things, you see. And so in that case, you know, the LCS and God kind of are, are a, a matchup. But there's a lot of people that have a lot of, of individual kind of dogmatic things wrapped around religion. And I don't go there because MBT, my big toe, has nothing that you need to believe. Matter of fact, belief is the enemy in my, in my scheme of things. If you believe something that belief will limit your ability to find out for sure what's going on. You just believe it. You stop asking questions. So, you know, in MBT, it's believe nothing. Be skeptical of everything. And that includes everything I say, too. You have to be skeptical of it. If it's not your, if it's not your experience, then it's not really your truth. So, you know, I implore everyone to be skeptical and find out for yourself whether there's truth in this or not. And there's many ways you can do that. So, you know, and I, I give people tools to help them do that. You can find them at my website. So that's... Let's go, let's go back to the death, uh, Tom. Just yeah. Okay. 
So you die, you end up in the transition reality. Now the transition reality, it, the first thing that it wants to accomplish when somebody who's just died shows up, it wants to make them relax and let go and not be so hysterical about am I in heaven or I'm in hell or what's going on here, or, you know. So mostly it's just to comfort and to get people to let go. Now, the thing that helps people letting go from the past experience is that their, their past life that they just exited starts to fade, just like dreams fade. Mm -hmm. The instant after they died, they remember every detail of it, Eh, you know, a minute later, it's kind of fuzzy, you know, three or four minutes later, they only got the highlights. And you know, by five minutes later, eh, it's kind of, you know, yeah, I remember having that dream, but mm, you don't relate to it that much anymore. You know, that's the way dreams are. And that's the way your past life is. So they just want you to kind of be still and connect and be happy and be positive, just long enough for all those, those past life memories to disappear like what, a dream. Why do you think that happens? Well, what that, why that happens is because all of that past life stuff brings a lot of fear with it. There's a lot of fears there and trying to deal with all of that when there's really nothing you can do about it. It's over, right? Oh, I left my children. Who's going to take care of them? Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. You know, oh, you know, am I in heaven or I'm in hell? Am I going to be punished forever? So you, you have all this junk that people are struggling with, are afraid of, and they're fearful because this is the unknown now. So they're in the unknown and people are kind of afraid of the unknown. So you have to kind of comfort them as they show up. And the way the system does that is somebody, you know, it's like the Walmart greeter. I don't know if that makes any sense to you in South Africa, but yeah, you know, here we have these, these big stores and there's somebody stands inside the door. Welcome to Walmart. You know? Yeah. What are you looking for? Oh, hardware's over there. You know, that kind of a person. So you kind of have the greeters there that uh, welcome people to say, everything's fine. You're doing great. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to like it here, whatever, just things to make people, oh, really? And they kind of look around and everything's clean and looks nice. And then if the people who are a little more worried, the ones that have more fear, then they get to see relatives. Oh, look, there's your Uncle Fred that died 10 years ago. You know, he's, he's come here to greet you. Well, it's not really their Uncle Fred. That's just a, um, that's just a, what a, a representation of Uncle Fred from the database. And we'll, we later we'll talk about what database and why do we have a database and, and so on. But, uh, it's not really your uncle Fred, your uncle Fred's gone off to some other, <laughs> other experience packets. You know, he's not hanging around just waiting for you to die so he can say hello. Yeah. That just doesn't make any sense. So, uh, uncle Fred and aunt Susie and lots of people, whoever, you know, who's died, you know, they come and they tell you what a wonderful place it is and you'll do fine. And, and they greet you and you relax and say, ah, well, this seems like a nice place. I guess I'm not going to hell. I guess this is going to be okay. And then you relax. And that's the whole point of it. Sometimes, uh, depending on your level of stress, they will just tell you to do things that are just busy work in order to get you to just pass some time by and relax and let go. So often they'll say, well, okay, uh, yeah, we have you right here. Uh, what's your name? You know, Joe Smith. Oh yeah, Joe, we've been waiting for you. You know, go over there. See that, that lady over there, uh, uh, go see that line. She's processing people and go stand in that line. And when she gets to you, she'll tell you what to do next. Well, there is no point. The lady's not doing anything at all. <laughs> She's just creating a line so that people have something to do for a while and they don't get panicked or upset or, okay, what's next? What am I supposed to do? You know, is this the, you know, this is the eternal, you know, do I need to know how to play a harp? You know, what's going on here? So they, it just gives them something to do. It takes up their time. And, uh, if they're still stressed by the time they get to the end, front of the line, well, she'll tell them to go over. Now she has to see the guy over there. You know, he's, he handles people like you, you know, it's just buying more time. Well, eventually people get over it. They forget entirely about their past life 
they don't really have any member of it. They don't have any of the cares or the worries about their children or, you know, what happened to the, you know, they had a wreck in a car, you know, did, am I the only one that didn't survive or what, you know, all that stuff just kind of goes away. And uh, they're assured that everything's fine. Oh yeah. Your children are fine. You know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And eventually they'll get to a point where they will get kind of bored and they'll wonder, well, what's next? You know, okay, so what do I do? I've been standing around here for a long time. Let's go to wherever the action is, and somebody will talk to you about the next life you're going to have and the kind of things you should work on and the kind of things you didn't do very well last time that you need to work on. And if you can't understand that, they may give you a little life review. of. It's like you sit down and watch this movie of your past life, and it's the movie of you making very poor choices. And you'll skip from one poor choice to the next and, you know, being rude, being, being unpleasant, being self-centered, you know, all these things you're trying to outgrow. Cause remember, we're trying to grow toward love and you'll look at that and you go, oh yeah, I guess I do need to, you know, work on that. And then you, you get another, you get offered another place to go when you're ready. And you can always say, no, I don't like that one. They'll tell you a little about it and if they'll give you a different one, you know, so, and you can kind of say, well, what I'd like next time, I want to be filthy rich. I want to be born into a family that's got a billion dollars in the bank. And, uh, you know, because last time all those mistakes I made, I just made them because I was poor. It wasn't me. You know, I didn't, it's not that my quality of consciousness isn't good. It's just that I had a really bad situation. Well, <laughs> you know, they point out that that's, they show you this, this past life review where that really wasn't true. It wasn't so much that you were poor. It's just as you were negative, but they may give you that. And you may be born into a family that has a billion dollars. And typically you don't do much better. <laughs> you, know, you become a monster, you know, you become, you know, you, you run over a lot of other people because now you have power and you're still nasty <laughs> and not doing, <laughs> making good choices and so on. And you may de evolve if you make enough bad choices. And with all that power and not much growth, you're likely to de-evolve if you've got that much power. So you'll come back out from that and you'll be two or three steps behind where you were last time because you've made a lot of terrible choices. And then you thought, oh, being rich wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> you know, that, that set me back because I could really mess things up and make a lot of entropy, uh, you know, raise entropy a lot uh, with all that power. So anyhow, this is the process of learning. So you always have free will. You can always say no. You can always wait. There are other places besides this virtual reality that you can go to, but most people just come back to the same one because they already know how it works here. You go to a different one and it's a completely different ball game. So most people come back to the ones that they're used to. So, so anyway, that's kind of what happens when you die. Then you go back, you get another body. Right, the, your IUOC puts another partition down, creates another free will awareness unit that just has the level of of growth that you've made up to this point. So your your growth is cumulative. You keep growing, and then you go off, and now you're an infant again. You may you may go into that. You may log on to that fetus even before it's born, because as long as there are things to trigger your senses then you're getting information. So, you know, maybe it's just light and feeling and you're in a squishy fluid sack and, you know, maybe you can do a little punching on the inside of mom or whatever, you know, but you, you can hear voices, hear music. You get a sense of attitudes and feelings, you know, are people nice and happy or are people sad and angry? So all of that stuff will affect you somewhat. And then you're born and so on life goes until you die and then the whole thing recycles again. So that's basically the way life works. If you're very frightened when you die, it'll take a little longer for you to process through the, you know, relaxing and, and get over it phase. Uh, if you're not, if you're an old hand at that, you've been, you've been around through the process enough times that you need it, then, then you skip steps. You don't, you don't have to go stand in a line or do any of that kind of stuff because that's not really important. You know, you go straight to the, to the place where you start thinking about 
what you need to do next. What are the kinds of things that you failed to do well last time and how can you work on those and, and uh, set your mind to kind of focusing on those things so that when you have your next incarnation, you, you'll tend to be aware of those things. Anyhow, that's the way, you know, life and death is. And it's the same consciousness, just multiple incarnations. And we have to have a lot of variation in our, in our incarnation. Sometimes you need to be male, sometimes female, sometimes, you know, all the races, you know, white and black and yellow and green and pink and whatever there are, you have to experience all of those various cultures because all of that gives you different perspectives and different choices to make. You don't want to just get a life where you make the same kind of choices all the time. You know, you're not going to grow up much from that. You need lives that, that give you an array of different sorts of choices in different circumstances, which is why you don't take your intellect along because if you did, all you do is try to game the system. Oh, well, what choice should I make here? Oh yeah, I should, I should do this. Well, that's the acting kind instead of the being kind. That's not going to help you. We don't want you to try to gain the system. You know, you, you need to act out of who you are sincerely, out of the authentic you has to make the choice. Well, the way the authentic you has to make the choice is that all the intellectual part is gone. So what's left is the authentic you. So that's why you shouldn't, you know, that you don't want all that knowledge. Not only that, it would be ridiculously cumbersome if you were aware oh let's see i've had uh, twenty thousand wives and about uh, sixty thousand children and i loved every one of them dearly they were my whole reason for living and you know you can't keep track of all of that stuff because you're not just going to be two or three incarnations and now you're brilliant and you know everything <laughs> you're going to do this thousands of times so you need to let go of the past, start out with an authentic expression of who you are. Then you have authentic choices and you can learn something from an authentic choice. You can't game the system because you don't have any information to game it with. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's no user's manual. You know, there's no, that we don't understand all this when we come back. It's, uh, it's better that we don't. We're more authentic and we have a higher probability of success if we just come in and we have to make choices that express who we are. And then we have to live with those consequences. So uh, one other thing I'd say about that, that if you are growing up, lowering your entropy, you tend to have a happy life. You tend to find satisfaction, peace. Um, you know, your life is very good. You smile a lot. If you are not growing up, if you are mostly in the fear category and self-centered and fearful, your life is miserable. It's always a struggle. Everything seems to go wrong. There's always the next hurdle that's blocking you, that's in front of you. You blame everything on everybody else except yourself. You know, that's the life you live and it's miserable. It's, uh, it's painful. So it's in everybody's interest to actually try you know to to level up in this game by by being kind and being helpful and being caring and getting rid of that self-centered stuff you know get rid of that ego that's all about you make it about other people love is about other fear is about self so within so that, that's death within that um goal-directed framework where you're constantly coming back um, in order to fulfill mm. this what happens when you actually truly do fulfill that and you reach that lowest entropic state where the person is now embodies love in that in the sense that you're talking about well there's a couple of issues here one um it's true that the more you evolve the easier it is to evolve more so the steps you take tend to be bigger and bigger so you get there faster and faster uh, as time goes on on the other hand on the other side of that coin is that the changes that you make are changes really of refinement you know if you're pretty good and you you've lost all those crass you know things you stop you know killing people you stop beating your children you know and your wife you stop kicking the dog you know if you've gotten if you've kind of gotten over all those crass things well 
now you're refining something that is already pretty good. And those refinements come in smaller and smaller increments. So it's easier to learn more, but what you're learning more now has to do with refining. You know, you're trying to lower entropy. Well, one of the facts of life is entropy never goes to zero. You can't ever get it to zero. You can approach zero. You can get asymptotic to zero in math language, but you never actually get to zero. And you have to always work on it because if you don't put effort in to work on it, if there's no energy put in, then you start to backslide. Entropy just starts to rise up because you're not putting the effort to keep it down. You know, that's the second law of thermodynamics, you know, that uh, systems that are not reversible, you know, systems that evolve and move and change, if there's no energy put into them, they automatically decay. Everything has a shelf life. Everything decays. Even a, even a block of steel, if you wait long enough, it'll evaporate. That steel block will get smaller and smaller and smaller until it's gone, just like an ice cube. You know, you put an ice cube in a freezer and you let it sit there long enough, the ice cube's gone. You know, it sublimates into water vapor. That's just because entropy, water vapor is a higher entropy state than ice. You know, so that's just the nature of reality and it's the nature of, re of consciousness as well. So you have to always be putting effort in. So you never get to the point where you say, I'm done. You know, I've gotten here. You know, my entropy is really, really low. I can't, I can't lower it much more except by tiny increments. So I quit. Well, as soon as you quit, your entropy starts going up again. Your, your ego starts getting bigger. You start feeling good about yourself. Oh, I made it to the top. I'm better than all those other people. You see, now all that's just ego talking. That's not, you know, that's not high quality. High quality, you don't put yourself above others. You don't look down on other people. You're not condescending. All that's low quality, not high quality. So what you do instead is you decide that, well, what can I do to help? It's not just about me. You see, if it's just about you and you've just been working on lowering your entropy and now you got it really low, yay me, well, that's all about you. What have you given back? How have you helped? How have you helped everybody else succeed? Oh, I haven't. It's just all been about me. Well, then you're not that grown up. You see, you just think you're that grown up. If it's all about you, then you've got a lot to learn yet. So that's the point. So there really is no end. You always can be helpful to others. You can always incarnate back here in a situation and you don't have to be a big guru or, you know, lead, you know, the masses to salvation or something. All you have to be is just a good person. You know, just somebody who's helpful and caring and happy and smiles and just be a low entropy person because just by being that way, you'll help other people become that way. You will be a good example and you'll just, people around you will make you, will, they'll feel better. When they're hanging out with you, they all kind of feel better than not. So you're a, you're a force to help them uh, grow up. So you come back and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So there is no end to it. Now, a lot of the religious theologies always, you know, they have ends to it because otherwise it's a hard sell. If, if you tell people, well, oh, what's, what's the point, they say, and say, well, so you can be helpful to others. Well, you know, when do I graduate? When do I get done? And if you say, never, <laughs> you're doing this forever because, you know, you're, a, you're an information system and we can always get better. If just you and 10 people and you all care for each other, that's nice, but you need to care for everybody on the planet and all the dogs and cats too, you know, and, everything you need to be take care of the planet and its environment you know there's lots of things that are positive that you need to learn to do so there's no end to that you can always come back and teach and be helpful well that's a hard sale you know why would why would somebody want to pay their money into that collection plate you know when the other collection plate says oh yeah you know when you die, if you do everything right and keep that collection plate full, you'll go to heaven. And that's it. You'll just be happy and be 
perfectly, uh, you know, content forever. Well, that's a easier sell. Oh, that sounds good. What I got to donate a lot of money to the church and well, I'm in forever. Um, or like in the, in Buddhism, you return to the Godhead. Okay. You go up, but you get to the point that then you just become a part of God and that's it. But you see, that's contrary to what the larger consciousness did in the first place. It had to break itself up into pieces so that there were these pieces that, uh, you know, interacted with each other. The idea, everybody lowers their entropy, everybody gets up, everybody returns to the Godhead, then what do you have? You've just moved backwards, a long way backwards. Now you have one, you know, one uh, chunk of consciousness where all the pieces have returned. Well, it's very limited. It'll start to de-evolve rather quickly. You know, the point is that you've got billions of pieces that all have to learn to work together cooperatively and caring for everybody. Well, that's a harder thing to do, you see, and one monolithic thing can't do that. It can just kind of care for itself, but that's kind of self-focused, you know, <laughs> caring for others is a tough thing when you're the only thing around. So it, you end up de-evolving. So that's really headed in the wrong direction. So I don't think that the joining the Godhead is, is really the, the point, unless the larger system has way too many IUCs out there and it'd like to, you know, like to cut the number down, you know, the number of seats in the game has gotten too large. I'd like to cut some down. Then some of those might just be absorbed back into the LCS. Yes. But, uh, not in general, that's not the way that it's going to be. That's not the point is not to go up and, and become part of the deity. It's to keep helping others. See others. You know, unless you're the last one, everybody else has everybody else has succeeded, and you're the last one. You know, but it's not going to be that way. There's always new coming in at the bottom. People are having babies, new new uh, avatars are all the time, and you need a someone needs to uh, you know just to keep this virtual reality going. You know, needs to play the part of those avatars, or the system gets stuck playing all of them. You know, now they're they're not. IUOCs, they're NPCs, non-player characters, because the, the, the server is playing the parts of all of those. Well, now the whole system, this whole entropy uh, reduction trainer system has become inefficient. You know, it's starting, to, it's starting to outlive its usefulness. So I don't think any of that's going to happen. There's always going to be those who aren't as, as far along as you are. And if you can help them, then if you're grown up, what you want to do is help them. You don't want to quit and go play a harp on a cloud for eternity. You want to be helpful. You want to get back in the game and be part of the solution. That's what you like doing. That's what makes you happy. So you're, you're, you're incarnated, let's say, and you go through this journey. Two logical scenarios can arise. One is the information is, is neither created nor destroyed in, this, in that sense. But let, let's say the information continues. That means you have access to information from the previous avatar's existence. So that opens the door to talking to a past life or, or seeing a past life, at least. Right. And also, the information also can perhaps intrude into the future, perhaps into a near-death experience. How would those two things occur? <clears throat> well, a near-death, let's just jump to a near-death, and then we'll talk about the data, because now you're touching on this database that I was talking about, and I can explain why there is a database, why there has to be a database, and uh, how, what that means to be able to access it. That's where Uncle Fred was, the guy came to greet you, you know, he was basically a projection out of that database. Because everything we do, think, thought about doing but didn't, doesn't matter, every feeling, all of that is part of a database. And there's a reason why the system has to collect that data, and I'll get into that later, but an NDE is basically somebody who is, they say, a near-death experience, but the body maybe dies for a little bit and then gets resuscitated. So when I say dies, I mean it, it, it goes past the point of where life could be supported at that state that the physical things in couldn't support life, but it doesn't mean that that state can't be changed to where it can support life again. So people 
get in this spot where they're dead for a little bit, or if nothing else happened to bring them back, they would be dead. But something else happens and raises their potential for life back up positive again, and now they come back. So they are out there. Remember I said when you die, you kind of come awake and you say, oh, where am I? You know, what's going on here? Well, they end up in that state, in the, hmm, where am I and what's going on here? And the way the system works is they start into the transition. So they get a something positive. Maybe they see a light. And, you know, the reason, so it's like, well, the light says, so come on, we come here. We've been waiting for you. You can have a good time here. You're really going to like it. You know, it starts positive. And most of the NDEs are positive. You know, that's typically the way they are. They'll see dead relatives. They'll, uh, they'll uh, have a, an experience with the bright light that is nothing but love, you know, and they'll get consumed and connected to this. Well, all that is is them experiencing the larger consciousness system, them experiencing consciousness at its best, you know, at a, a low entropy consciousness. And when they do that, of course, that's a life-changing experience. When you do that, you lose all the sense of I, who you are, and you become one with everything. And it's such a, it's such a, uh, I don't know what to say, profound experience that it changes people. They see this light, they, they become part of it, and then they're one with all, and there's nothing but love. They're just experiencing the system and how the system sees things. And that's given to them just to show them kind of the heart or the core of what consciousness is all about. And then they pat them on the butt and send them back into the game. You know, it says, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to die. Go back there and tell people about this. So then it helps open other people's minds. Other people say, oh, wow, you know, that was, that was amazing. There must be something on that other side that does that because there's literally tens of thousands of these NDEs and there's a lot of consistency, you know, in the stories they tell. So if they were all just making it up on their own, there wouldn't be that consistency. So it kind of lends some credibility to the fact that there is something else, that this is not just a materialist reality that's a machine and everything that happens is, you know, random, basically, or determined. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a deadening concept, not a you know, not an opening up and enlivening concept, you know, well, you're nothing, you don't count for anything, there is no purpose in your life, you know, so grab everything you can grab, have a good time, and that's what it's all about. Well, when you go on that path where you're grabbing everything and just having a good time, you end up miserable, because you're not, you're being very self-centered, you're not learning, you're not growing, and that life becomes empty and eventually unpleasant and you become depressed and you know that's not what it's all about so materialism kind of pushes people in the wrong direction you know greed is a good thing i'm grabbing everything i can grab because it doesn't matter anyway you know it's survival of the fittest and i got more money than you i must be more fit than you you know well that's nonsense that's not the way <laughs> the way it works at all but that's kind of where a materialist viewpoint gets you. So the system would like to sow some seeds of, it's not like that. Reality's bigger and more significant and more important and more beautiful than just a random machine where you can do whatever you want because it doesn't matter anyway, because there is no purpose, you see. So it goes out of its way to give people positive experiences and then send them back with a story to tell. And it does. These people write books. And, you know, a lot of people get this and they think, well, hmm, there must be something else going on, you know, because that guy was dead for five minutes and then they resuscitated his body. And uh, he has this big story to tell. So he's kind of been there and seen it and come back to tell us about it. So it's, it's part of the way that the larger conscious system tries to help us grow and, you know, become love and understand there's a bigger picture. So that's what's going on. Now, some people who are extremely fearful, 
the same ones that would take longer, you know, they may take a while when they get to that transition reality to calm them down because they, they know bad, bad little girls, and little boys, and they're going straight to hell and it's going to be horrible. And they believe that. So they come in almost in a panic, you know, now they've died. They, they uh, got run over by a truck, didn't even have a priest or somebody, uh, you know, absolve them of all their sins before they died. And, and, uh, so you have some of those they will have negative experiences because that's what they expect. So the experiences they're having are basically like dreams. It's things that they're making up that reflect their beliefs. And it just takes a while for them to get out of that and realize that, no, it's really not that way. That's just you kind of, you know, going out and, and uh, living all the things you've been told and the beliefs and so on. So a few people, have that, but most people don't. Most people aren't that, what, that um, invested, you know, in there. Most people who are religious go because it's a social thing. It's where their friends are. They meet. They have dinners, potluck dinners together. They go bowling. <laughs> you know, they go skating. They do things. You know, it's a social club. And, you know, they have to listen to the preacher preach, but they only have pay attention because they're thinking about what they're going to do afterwards and and uh, so on. So most people claim to be a member of a religious faith, but the great majority don't take it that seriously, but some do. And the ones that do, if they haven't been very wonderful people, they start to feel very fearful when they die. So that's really what the NDEs are about. It's an experience that people have, and they have different experiences because the system doesn't just give everybody the same experience. It would sound like, oh, I got, they got that experience because they read the book of what somebody else did. You know, it's all just copycat. Uh, it's just, you know, that's a part of the culture. They're making all up the same thing. So there's a lot of varied experiences, individual experiences that, that people have. But, you know, you can have that experience almost any time you want. All you have to do is go get a good meditation state, get consciousness, and have an intention to connect with the larger system. And there it is. You've got it. You can have that experience. You can be absorbed into the light and be one with everything and feel that love and feel your connection to everything else. That's not an experience that you have to die or almost die to get. It's available. That's what the that's what the uh, the Buddhists and the Hindus talk about, you know, their nirvana. They're going to, you know, they have this this uh, profound experience of love and positivity. That's what they're talking about. So it's it's not you don't have to die to do that. All you have to do it is learn to learn to let go. Yeah, now that's their enlightenment. Yeah. It's not. That's not really enlightenment. That just means that they've learned to control their consciousness to the point that they can let go and become one with things. It's nice, but it's not the end of the road. What's really important is how kind and helpful they are the other people. You can be very self-centered and get that experience. You know, it's not only the people who are almost near death that, are, that aren't self-centered. You can be very self-centered and still get to that experience and still have a long way to evolve. But that's some of the differences. You know, that's religions create dogmas and beliefs, and then they kind of work toward those beliefs. So anyway, uh, I think that answers your question. That's NDEs. Now, what we're going to get to is the database. So the database has to be created, but it, it's created first as a, probable future database everything i say everything not not really meaning everything but let me just use that word everything that is possible to happen and the probability of each one of those possibilities okay so there's some event that'll happen and maybe that event will has might go you know 20 different ways so those are all the possibilities now, each one of those has a probability. Some are more probable than others. You know, if they're all equally probable, then, you know, that, that's possible too. But they all have probabilities. 
Now, the reason that the system has to know that about the probable future is that that's how it knows what to render next. You see, if this were a bottoms, a bottom, I shouldn't say bottoms, that makes it a different thing. If it's a bottom up, you know, bottoms up is either drinking or, or yeah. giving, mooning somebody, right? It's, it's one of those two things. But bottom up means you start at the detail level and move back up toward, you know, the more fundamental level. So it's, it's, it's that way. So if you do that, then you'd start with elementary particles and you would take uh, them and make atoms and then the atoms to make molecules and the molecules to make physical stuff. So that would be, you have to calculate that and physics and, uh, science in general is materialistic and therefore deterministic. And they would tell you that if I had the, the state of every particle in the universe, then I can compute everything else forever because the physics just rules. It's the rules of how things have to change. So if I knew what everything was, I just apply the rules and I'd know how everything had to change. And there is no free will. There is no consciousness. Laplace is deep. Uh, I, yeah, actually, there is no time, you know, so they have to get rid of all those things because materialism is not logically compatible with any of those things. You know, it, it's com only compatible with determinism. So in any case, this system isn't made that way. That would be a hugely inefficient way to run a, a model of, re of this reality, trying to, you know, I mean, how many particles, you know, we have, we have like, what, three trillion cells or something just in one body. And each one of those cells has, has probably trillions of trillions of trillions of atoms and, and, and uh, you know, elementary, each, each atom has a whole bunch of elementary particles. And, you know, I mean, it just gets to be impossible to deal with that if you're trying to build something from the ground up. It doesn't work. So what works is that you have a rule set. Remember the rule set, initial conditions and a rule set is what made the, made the reality. So you have that rule set and that rule set is mostly deterministic with some probability included in it because some natural processes are, are random. And you have that rule set so you can create models of things, look at their probability, and then use that probability model to actually run the simulation. And the best example I can, I can give of that is a, is a cannon firing cannonballs. And I'll do this real quickly is that if you had to compute where the cannonball landed from the bottom up, it'd be too hard to do. You'd have to deal with every molecule of the cannon, every molecule of the wick, every molecule of the powder and you know, all of that. And then you'd have to deal with all the atoms and then you'd have to deal with all the, you know, and it gets crazy. And of course, everything's changing. The cannonball goes out. The cannon doesn't have a perfect cylinder. The cannonball isn't perfectly round. The powder doesn't burn, you know, evenly. You got all this stuff. The cannon, the cannon material gets hot because it, you know, the, the it creates a lot of heat. As it gets hot, all those molecules start doing different things. The barrel starts to sag a little. And, you know, so to keep up with all of that from the bottom up, we couldn't do it. You could get all the computer all the supercomputers in the world together and they still couldn't run that simulation in real time for just one simple cannon, much less the whole world, you know, it's too hard. So what you do is you take a model of a cannon from the reef, get the rule set. Okay. You get your cannon and you let it be statistically not, not a, a perfect sphere for the ball. Statistically, you know, you do this all with statistics, statistically that it's not perfectly round statistically how the powder burns. And you throw all that together and you say, okay, I fire this ball and it's going to land here. Then you fire another one. All those statistics mean it's going to land someplace else. It's not going to land exactly there. And you do it until you have a pattern. That's called, you know, th that is ballistic dispersion is what we call it. When we fire a cannon a thousand times, none of those balls will land on top of each other. Exactly. They'll all land in a pattern somewhere around, you know, out there where the cannon's pointed. Well, that becomes now a probability distribution of where that cannon will, will send a, a ball. So now when you're in the, a civil war 
with, you know, 10,000 cannons always firing as fast as they can, every time a cannon fires, you go up and you do a random draw from that probability distribution, and that's where you put the ball. Okay, so you, you have this distribution of the possibilities. Some will be right where it's pointed, some will be off to the left, some off to the right, some a little closer, some a little further away, all of them. You have all these probabilities. If it's off to the right, then the probability is less that it's going to be off to the right. If it's right down the middle, well, there's a higher probability that it's going to land there. You see what I mean? So then they go into the distribution, do a random draw out of that. And, ah, this one's off to the right. Ah, the next one's right in the middle. Ah, the next one's off to the left. And so on. They're just random draws from those possibilities and those probabilities. So then the system then just puts those cannonballs there. And nobody knows. The soldiers all running around. <laughs> they hear the boom. The ball lands someplace. And they don't say, oh, that ball shouldn't have landed there. You know, that's not right. It lands where it lands. You, the system doesn't have to do it to that much accuracy. In the Civil War, nobody was, would fault it if, uh, you know, it landed someplace really squirrely. It just, things go boom, things land. So it can do that to what, it only has to do that maybe to, you know, the, in an integer. It doesn't even have to do it to one decimal place. It just roughly can do it because nobody's measuring. So it makes a really simple calculation when you don't have to do it to, you know, 20 decimal places. You don't have to do it, you know, you can round it off to the nearest meter, would be fine. Um, so that's, that's a model, and you see how simple that is. Now you have, a, you have the simulation of this war with the 10,000 cannons. It's no, no sweat. Those little random draws are almost instantaneous. There's no big calculation. So you've, you've reduced something that is so hard we can't do it to something that's almost trivial. You just pull random things out. So in a bottom-up simulation, if there could ever be such a thing, that bottom-up simulation, you always know what's going to happen next because it's just what the machine is going to do next given where it is now. But when it's a probability-based model, there is no way to know exactly what's going to happen next. Right? So what happens next is a random draw from that probability distribution of the possibilities. That's what happens next. You see, that then allows the model to, to move forward. Now that has lots of, lots of, uh, uh, of its own logical possibilities. So we get a, you know, and here's one of my, my favorite metaphors is that you get a scientist, he's looking with a big telescope that can look further than anybody's seen before. Nobody's ever seen that, whatever's out there. Well, what, what's out there has to be something like what we see out there, you know. I mean, it can't be something off the wall. It has to be, you know, dust and swirls and suns and stuff that's there because we've already seen some. But there's maybe a thousand different things, maybe a hundred thousand different things that could be out there, and they all have a probability. So that guy turns on his telescope and he takes a look at random draws taken from all those possibilities and their probability, and that's what he sees. That defines it. In other words, that piece of space was not defined before. There was nothing there because it wasn't defined. It had never been rendered before. It was a new rendering of something that had not been rendered. So how do you know what's there? You don't. So you take a random draw from, all the, from the probability distribution of the possibilities. Now, it's not just a random draw from the, pro, from the possibilities. That would get you all kinds of squirrely stuff, but it's a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities, which means mostly that random draw is going to be more of what you expect. The things with higher probability will get drawn out more likely. But every once in a while, you pull something out of the tail of that curve that's only one in a million, and bang, that's what you get, you know? So now this guy with his telescope, he takes his picture, and he publishes it. Anybody else who looks there will see the same thing. Because once it comes into this reality, it stays here. Now, what if that guy, he is took that his... Is that rendering then permanently left there? Or does it, it can it just go away and then come back sort of when needed? Well, what happens... Well, no, it's not always rendered. It's only rendered if somebody looks. But if somebody looks, then it's rendered to the people looking. It's not rendered to anybody else. You only get rendered to what you 
Did you mean that the your senses can see? Mean the photograph was now the information that's always going to be. Yeah, there. that photograph now tells you what's going to be there when you look. When you look, that's what will be rendered. But it's not rendered all the time. It doesn't really exist. So there was that was exist before, and now anybody that looks there will see that. So that's the way it works. But you know, you don't have to do something like look into outer space. All you have to do is get a shovel and dig a hole. It's the same thing. When you dig that hole and you put it up, nobody's seen that before. It's new stuff to be rendered. So you go into a probability distribution, and that's what we know what's in that hole. Dinosaur bone, uh, gold doubloon, dirt, <laughs> you know, rocks. Now, that's higher probability, right? Dirt, rocks, roots. That kind of stuff is real probable, and the gold doubloon is not too probable unless you live maybe on the Gulf Coast or someplace. What about, where, what about those far less probable ones like the near-death experiences or even just communicating with past lives? How did those really occur then within the okay, well, what Okay, well, what happens is that that database, they collect this big database, and that database is just probabilities now. That the things don't have to happen that way. We have free will. It's just saying present trends continue. Here's what we judge will happen next. And given that that's true, here's what will happen next after that. And given that that's true, here's what, well, the further out you go, then the rattier it gets. You know, it gets to where you've got this whole string of assumptions all in a line. And when what happens isn't what was expected, then the system has to go back and recalculate that change and all the things that that change affects gets recalculated, you know, into the probable future again. But that's not really that hard to do. So time goes by, and that, pro, you know, that uh, future probable, or I should say probable future database becomes the past. We're past that point now. So now you end up with this database. That's everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have happened. It's a past probable database. And what actually did happen is just a little thread that kind of wanders through that bunch of probabilities. Those are the choices you actually did make. Now that database is in consciousness. It has to be made because the rendering engine needs it. It becomes the past. And why does it keep the past? Well, you can learn from the past. The past can be very educational. So it's all there. So Uncle Fred, you know, his lifetime is all there. Again, it's everything about Uncle Fred. And if anybody wants to go talk to Uncle Fred later on, you, you go pay a medium to go dial up Uncle Fred and you know, she has a conversation with Uncle Fred. Well, she's, she's getting data out of that database. Uncle Fred doesn't exist anymore. Uncle Fred's free will awareness unit was, had the partition taken down and was you know, reabsorbed into the individuated unit of consciousness. So Uncle Fred's gone. Uncle Fred does not live on forever. None of us do. But the consciousness does. That IUOC lives on forever. And it's got Uncle Fred and, and a whole bunch of other incarnations beside Uncle Fred that that consciousness has made. So that becomes part of the larger database. So if you would like to go into a past life or look at things in the past, you can go into that database. But you have to be a little careful because it's not just the database of what did happen. It's the database of everything that could have happened and the probability. So if you just go into it and you don't really know what you're doing, you're liable to wander off that thread, which was just the things that actually did happen. And you could go into probability. So with your intent, your intent is the query into that database. Your intent has to be very specific. And it has to specify that you want to just look at things that are on that thread of the things that actually did happen. If you're interested in a, like a past life, um, and you can look at it and you can do what if games. You could say, well, what if this didn't happen? How would that change things? Well, the whole thing will just run through the probabilities. If that didn't happen, then it would change this probability, which would change, go to that probability, which would go to that probability, because all the probabilities are in there. So it just takes a, a line running through all the probabilities that would be most likely to have occurred because this thing now didn't happen. So you could go there and, and you can say, well, what would happen if the Axis powers had won World War II? What would the world be like? 
What would it have been like a year later, 10 years later, 20 years later, 50 years later? And you will get answers to all of that. So you can do those kinds of things. What if I had married Sally instead of Sue? What would my life be like now? You know, what would it have been like a year after I married Sally or two years or 10 years? Uh, you know, if I hadn't forgotten my wife's birthday three years in a row, you know, what, what would my life be like now? You know, well, you wouldn't have gotten divorced and, you know, you, you know it, it'll show you those probabilities. So you can learn a lot of things and do a lot of what if analysis with those databases. They're okay. something medium, that's valuable. Um, do you think mediums are accessing those database or, or do you feel that for the most part, many of them are not really accessing some sort of a database? I find that when a lot of mediums try to access or talk about these things, they're not very specific with the information they provide. Or well, what, what do you think about that? Mediums have no idea how the nature of reality works. <laughs> All they know is they can, they learn, they don't think they're getting a database. They think they're actually talking to a dead uncle Fred. Yes. Uncle Fred dies. Everybody dies and then they hang out just waiting for somebody to talk to them. You know, they don't think about the, you know, how logical is that? You know, how, how rational an idea is that? They just know that they can go, they can drop into their intuitive side. They can have an intent for that information. I'd like to talk to Uncle Fred. And there comes the information. There is somebody. And they ask Uncle Fred a question or something, and Uncle Fred will tell them. So then it depends on the quality of the medium. If the medium is really very good, they will get lots of detail. They will, they will have that ability to take, to get the detail out of the, you know, out of the database. If they're not as good, then they'll just get generalities. They'll get less things. So that just depends on how good the medium is at their task. Mm. Um, some are better than others. Uh, you know, it, it just means how much did they practice developing their, their trait? Mm. So I'd say most of them, there's probably some mediums that are just charlatans and they don't do anything at all except make up stuff. But I think that's probably a very small minority. I think most of the mediums are genuine, and I think they've learned to access this information. But, you know, learning to do anything, you can learn it a little bit. You can learn it, you know, somewhat more. You can learn it kind of an average amount, or you can really excel at it like anything else. You know, you become a, a plumber. You can be okay at it. You can, you can be really fantastic at it you know i mean anything is like that well it's the same with the medium some are are much better than others it depends how much time they take trying to hone their skills how much confidence they build up in it what are they able to to get so some will get generalities because that's the level at which they work and those generalities may be all it's necessary it could be that their client just you know, that person died and their client who's alive never got the closure yet with that person before they died. And so they've been carrying around this big problem or guilt or something because they, they needed to have this, this closure first. And so it helps them. So in their case, generalities are good enough. You know, you don't need any more than generalities. Those kinds of things work fine. What the medium gets is they get feelings, they get attitudes. They get uh, some factual details, but again, you know, they they're they're from okay to to terrific, you know, and just depends on, and they're probably some days they may be better than others because they're just more, you know, if you meditate, if you've been meditating for a long time, you know, some days, oh man, it's a cinch. You can sit down and that meditation gets deep and smooth, and you get into it in a hurry, and it's awesome. And other times you sit there and nothing really much happens. I mean, everybody's like that, right? I mean, life is like that. So it's the same with mediums. You know, they're not always, you know, their game is not always on because doing that work requires that you get into a very specific intuitive state of mind. And if you have problems, you have issues going on in your life, if you have other things, well, they get in the way and kind of muddy the waters. So how good are you at putting all that stuff aside? How good are you at having a clear, noiseless environment, you know, in your mind to work with? Well, some days are better than others. Some people are 
you know, more skilled than others. So it's just like everything else. And you think everything. that crossing that crossing over or entering that sort of similar transition state is is purposeful in the sense that for the most part those those access to information situations tend to be very positive for people. So you think it sort of guides that process you're talking about? Yeah, of course, they're positive. The whole point of it isn't because the dead person needs something. Mm. Dead person doesn't need anything. They don't need closure or anything else. The, the point of it is that there's somebody here who's carrying around grief or guilt or some other kind of an issue that's really keeping them from going on and growing and making good choices. They may be wallowing around in self-pity because they didn't do the things they should have done, didn't say the things they should have said, said things they shouldn't have said. You know, they, before that person died, you know, they maybe went off on a rant and gave them a lot of grief, and now they they realize most of that was just them and their own, uh, you know, their own uh, frame of mind or something, and they wish they hadn't have done that. So, so they carry this stuff around. So most of the of the the clients that come to mediums. They're the ones that need healing. It's not that Uncle Fred has, is having problems. He's not having any problems. He's done. The, the, the client has issues. The client needs to know that Uncle Fred's okay. Because the client has, I don't know, they have ties or they have something they, they can't let go of. So they, if they just can talk to Uncle Fred and he says, I'm fine. You know, everything's great here. And they get convinced that it really is Uncle Fred because they get some personal details out of him. And they say, oh, yeah, if you told me that, then I know that really is, you know, my Uncle Fred. Then they, it heals that problem for them. So that's kind of the, the purpose and point of it is that it's healing for the, for the client that wants to do it. So that's what's important. So the messages are almost always positive, of course. The messages are almost always positive. So there's, you know, it's, it's true that if a person, you know, if a discussion between uh, the client and the dead person was such that it really would have changed the dead person's viewpoint, well, maybe the change in thoughts that the alive person had, and maybe the whole thing would actually could go back to that IUOC as a little bit of new information about that past life that they didn't have before. So it might actually affect a little bit, but you know, that's going to be very, very marginal. It wouldn't, so, it wouldn't be just a, a sort of the database that's stored already. It wouldn't, you think it actually would interact with the, the real data of the individual that's, that existed. You think it wouldn't just be accessing sort of past memories or, uh, Versions. False memory, yeah, false memories. Mm. Well, probably not if the medium is good. Oh, I see. If the medium's not good, then it's hard to tell what she. She may be adding stuff to it. You know, the information a person gets comes from only three possible sources. One of them is the larger conscious system, and the database would be just a part of that. So it comes from the system. It comes from some other consciousness. Some other IUOC because we're all netted. All consciousness is on a is on a network, so all conscious can talk to any other consciousness, or it comes from themselves. Their consciousness they can create information and send it as well. So in the process of of calling up dead Uncle Fred and having a chat with them, if the medium has some kind of issues that also connect with that problem or that thing, let's say she. You know, Uncle Fred jilted Aunt Susie. Now, Aunt Susie has come to, you know, to talk to Uncle Fred about stuff that she needs to work out. And the medium was also jilted by her husband. Now, she's got a personal, you know, uh, um, thing that this, this thing that her client is doing, you know, it also is part of her personal. Well, she may make up some information there, too, because it's hard to separate yourself out of it unless you are very skilled. Well, that's part of the skill level, is how completely you can isolate yourself, your own ego, your own fears from what you're doing. If you can isolate them completely, then you're a much better medium. 
If you can isolate them pretty good, but not completely, then you're not quite as good, and so on. So that's just part of the talent of the person is how much they can isolate themselves. Otherwise, they may be sticking you know, words into Uncle Fred's mouth because that's what they believe you know, Uncle Fred would think or feel. With, with, with along those lines of accessing information that's not part of everybody's day to day, how, how does the theory of everything explain accessing information beyond your, your own avatar? So sort of tele- telepathic experiences. Well, you have your piece of consciousness. You're not a body. As a piece of consciousness, you can access that database. It's available to you. The way you access it is with an intent. Ask a question, you know, send out an intention. The intention doesn't even have to be on purpose. You may just be thinking about something and that might trigger a response. You know, oh, I wonder how such and such is doing. You know, you may just not be in your conscious mind, but it's in your subconscious mind and a response comes. So we call this intuition. Oh, I just got a bolt out of the blue. I just suddenly understood something, you know, we, I got an information, you know, Aunt Susie's having a hard time. We ought to call her and see what's going on there. You know, so you get these things, these messages, conscious to consciousness from the, from the database, from the larger conscious system, and they're available to you. So if you want to look at somebody's health, well, you can get that right out of the database. That database is only, you know, I, we call it a historical, but it starts just one delta T after the present moment. So it's pretty current that delta T is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So the newest stuff in that database is only 10 to the minus 44 seconds old. So it's pretty much current, you know, from our viewpoint, it's, that's current, even though it's really in the past database. So then you can look at that data and you can say, all right, what I'd like to see is whether or not, uh, you know, this, this, this lump I feel over here, I want to see how, how serious that is. If it's, if it's really serious, like cancer and deadly, then I want it to be black. If it's not, I want it to be white. So then you look at it. If you see a black spot, then that's your answer. Now, if you had fear and, and were afraid you'd get a black spot, then you may just be listening to your own fear. You see, it may have been you feeding that information to yourself. So you have to get rid of all of that. That's what I mean. To, to do this well, you need to be able to, to control what you're thinking and how you're thinking and where it comes from, you know, and that's a skill that people gain over years and years and years of practice. They get better and better at that. So yes, that database is there. You can look at your health. You can look at somebody else's health and, and, uh, you also can come up with your own output. So this database is something you can ask a question and you can tell the database how you want the data you know, what the output data looks like, like the black and white that I just described to you. You know, you don't have to use black and white. You could do just the opposite. I want black to be the good thing and I want white to be the bad thing. So it's, it's irrelevant. You can specify the database. If you're a statistician, you can put error bars on it. (laughs) You can do all kinds of clever things. If you want to know, well, what's the accuracy of this information? You know, because there may be some uh, you know, maybe some of the information isn't as specific. If it's really old, it may not be that specific. You know, just like I said that it takes, you know, all the possibilities of everything that could happen. Well, not everything. It's got some point, you know, if the probability is less than 10 to the minus 20 or something, we're not interested. We're not going to count that as a possibility. You know, it's got some cutoffs that it, that it has to have. Same with the maintaining the database. If you go back and say, well, okay, I had a great, 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 great back in, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, a relative, and I want to know what did they have for lunch that day? You know, what did they have to lunch exactly 10,000 years ago from today, from right now at noontime, you know, what was my relative having for lunch that day? Well, that's not going to be in a database because that's not important anymore. That's all been erased. What hasn't been erased is that the system will make a, a statistical model out of it about what what those times were like and about what people might have eaten in those times. You know, that's still there. You know, there's some general thing of it, and it'll just go in there and pull out something typical. Oh, he had a clam sandwich, you know, 
because he lived on the bay of such and such. So it just picks that stuff out. That may not have anything to do with what you're, you know, with the question you asked, but it gives you an answer that is close, sort of like what your relative 10,000 years ago might have had for lunch. So it, it does things like that. It gives you the closest answer it gets. So they're not always right on. So you can ask it for error bars and it can say, well, you know, could have been different, could have been this, could have been that. Um, so that's, you can, what about te telecommunication? Is that something explained? That's, that's where that's, all consciousness is netted. Mm. So you can, you're, you are connected to people and on this net, it's sort of like the internet, you know, on the internet, um, there's a little X up at the upper right hand corner. And when you don't want to be open to that channel, you just click that X and the channel's gone. Well, you can do the same here. You can open and close channels. The people that you're close to and that you like and that you have a lot of feelings for and you're connected to, those people, the channels are almost always open. So you kind of have a sense of what their state is, where, how they are, what they're doing. Uh, you can go in and feel their feelings and you can, you know, and that's called an empath. You can be empathetic with them and gather all that information. Well, that just means you're, you're, you, the channel's open and you're paying attention to what's in the channel, what you can access in the channel. But you can also turn things off. You can open the channel and turn it off any way you want. For instance, this would be an example. If you're a person, if you're an empath, you get all this information and often empaths get overwhelmed by it. They can't, they, they can't deal with all the information they get and they don't know how to turn it off because they don't understand the nature of reality either, just like the mediums don't. So, they can't walk into, let's say, a busy store, you know, get some discount house and, you know, on evil Friday or whatever it is, you know, there's, there's a thousand people in there and they're all trying to grab things first. Well, an empath couldn't, couldn't get even close to that store <laughs> because all the, all the vibes they'd get would just be too much. They'd have to stay away, but they could say with their intent, well, I want to close off everything. I want to close off everything coming out of that store, except for people that have blue eyes. If they have blue eyes, I want to listen to it. And then they'd only hear the stuff with people with blue eyes. Or I only want to hear from people who have a birthday today. Hmm. Well, they'd only hear the stuff from people with a birthday today. They can select it. They just don't know that they can do that because they don't understand how that works. What do you call these phenomena? Do you personally, do you call them ESP? Do you, do you prefer using terms like that or? Uh, well, I would just say that they are things that are in the intuitive realm. The consciousness has two paths, two different paths by which it can process information. One is the intellectual path, which is basically a logical path. And the other one is an intuitive path which is not logical at all. It's totally outside of logic. On the in, everything paranormal takes place in the intuitive path. There is nothing paranormal that takes place on the, on the intellectual path. Matter of fact, the two of those can learn to work together, but mostly when you're not, when you don't have them develop very well, they tend to interfere with each other. So. How do you define paranormal? Paranormal, I think it's very simple. It's beyond normal. <laughs> it's outside of normal. Now, here's all the things, and normal in our culture is materialism. What materialism and determinism comes, you know, our physics, our science, our biology, our chemistry, all of that is, is, the, is the rules of the rule set. So we look at that, and that defines normal. Okay, you can explain it with physics. Now, the things you can't explain with physics, and there's lots of things you can't explain with physics. Every th physics is only good and biology and chemistry for explaining the objective world. The subjective world, I think we said that last time, the subjective world is a much bigger, more interesting, more meaningful world than the objective world. The objective world is just the stuff. Your body being part of that, it's just the stuff. But the subjective world is beauty, love, Justice, caring, 
you know, friendship, fairness, you know, all that stuff is subjective. It's not objective. And that's where most of our, our life's meaning comes from, the subjective side. So the paranormal is stuff that happens on the subjective side, not on the objective side. So paranormal means it cannot be explained by normal objective means. So that's just the definition of all of it. So there will be no normal explanation because it's, it's, it comes out of consciousness. It's not coming out of the rule set and the virtual reality. This is coming, this is things of consciousness. So consciousness has this big database and you can get information from it. All consciousness are netted and you can share information. You know, all that stuff happens in consciousness. It doesn't happen in the objective world. You can have a, an intent that modifies those probabilities. You can actually modify those probabilities. So when that random draw comes up, you've made all those probabilities a little more positive toward, you know, a little higher probability to the way you'd like it to come out. That's how we use our minds to heal by modifying the future probability. So all of these things are paranormal in that they have no objective explanation. But all right. Are there any paranormal? Neither, neither does fairness or love have any objective explanation, nor consideration, nor any of the other things that are you know, important to us in life. They don't have any objective either. I mean, how do you measure consideration? You know, how do you, you know, how do you do that? Well, you can't. You can make a scale, but ten people could make it all different ways, and you know, one and one wouldn't be more right than the other. You know, so these things are just subjective. And look at medicine. All of medicine is subjective. You know, when somebody says, I've got a pain, well, how much of a pain do they really have? You know, some people have pains and hardly notice them because they're tough that way. Mm. People who have constant pains learn to just ignore them. You know, and other people who have just the tiniest little something or other, it's, it's a big deal. It drives them crazy. It's horrible. So it's all subjective. So you, you deal with medicine and everything is statistical. They have to give this pill to 100,000 people and see what the results are. That's how they figure out whether that pill's any good or not, not because there's some objective analysis that they can do. It's all subjective analysis, and subjective analysis is only meaningful if you do enough of it that you get statistical significance. You have to do a sort of a clinical control trial and then get all yeah. that together. Exactly. So everything that happens on the subjective side is really not necessarily, you can't, you can't uh, explain it mm. from the, the objective side, doesn't explain the subjective side. That's what paranormal is. It's just stuff we don't understand. And when I say don't understand, that means the, the objective science can't explain it. Objective science will never explain it. It's not objective. It's consciousness. Consciousness is non-physical. So you can't have a physical explanation of something that's non-physical. You see, it just isn't, it doesn't work that way. It can't be done. So you have this, this one side of you that, that is all about the subjective. And this is the side that has to get data from that database. This is the side that has to be trained to be able to have a low noise environment, to get rid of your own attitudes and, and things like that and set them aside so you can be entirely detached from the data that you're getting. You don't mix it with any of your own feelings or attitudes or beliefs. So that's the skills that you have to develop on this intuitive side. Well, most of us have a pretty well-developed intellectual side because we practice at it. We start in kindergarten, we start learning facts, you know, and we, we get smart about how to hone our intellect and we don't do anything with our intuitive side. Most people were more intuitive when they were three years old than they are now as adults. So, you know, their development is like a, you know, it's probably not even as good as a newborn. <laughs> you know, it's like sub birth almost. Uh, people just live out of their heads. And, and ignore that other side of them. Now that other side's still there, 
things will jump into their mind. They'll get aha moments and stuff's there, but it's totally disorganized. It just happens whenever it happens and they have no control over it. And sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. You know, sometimes it's their own stuff getting in the way, uh, their own fears just being fed back to them. So they, they don't have any control over it. So it's a mess. It's just this big jumble of stuff that is hard to sort through. So we kind of walk away from it. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. You can develop the intuitive side to where it is actually more accurate and more reliable than is the intellectual information. Tom, the word, para right? word paranormal, Tom, is often associated either with what you're talking about. I mean, that love, um, people crossing over, having these great experiences. But then you have the other side where you've got movies like Paranormal Activity, lots of horror stories. What do you think is happening there? Part of that is just imaginative. That's not really stuff that happens. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is some, some goofy things that happen. And yes, you know, you have this ability to modify future probability. And if you really get everything lined up just right, and you're very powerful because you've got control over your mind, or you just have to have, or maybe you have just very strong uh, intensity in the way you feel, and your mind just kind of slips through uh, these states, kind of just because your mind is in different states all the time. You know, you're, if you take a look at brain waves, they're eh, changing, they're all over the place unless you really know how to control them. And then a person can put them all here or put them all there. But uh, if you get that, then you can get some, some pretty major phenomena. You can get, you know, uh, there's all sorts of records where, where people have created manifestations of things, but they can't do it because they want to. They just happened to cross into the right state at the right moment when they were full of some kind of intensity and a, you know, and a very whatever, and bang, go, you get something. All right. And that's a big flash. Okay. What did they do? They started a fire. You know, suddenly something catches on fire. Well, yeah, that can happen. Things can catch on fire because of what you do in your mind. That's a real thing. But the fact that it happens randomly, okay, so odd things happen. And they can happen randomly. So some of those things are probably real. But in the movies, of course, it, it's, it's entirely different. The movies are made just to be entertaining, not to be accurate. Yes. So, these, you know. It's, these experiences of, like, of accessing this information, deja vu would be one of those. Yeah, deja vu would be one of those. You, you could get information from a time that you or somebody you knew was there. You could be collecting it out of their mind. Or you could be collecting out of the database at a time you were there, maybe in a past life even. It would seem familiar to you. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that that would just, oh, this is so familiar. I know. If I walk into this store that I've never been in, I know exactly what's going to be in that back counter. All the way in that thing, there's going to be a, an ice cream shop, you know, and over here. And you walk in, it is that way. Well, how would you know that? Mm -hmm. Well, because you can get that database, get all that information out of the database. And, and the, the deja vu might just be that it's familiar somewhere in your mind, or it may be totally by accident. We, we interpret things based on pattern matching. So if you were someplace similar, if you'd seen a picture that was very similar, if it had been in a movie someplace, you know, and you saw some picture that was similar and you had that in your mind as a pattern, and then you see it, ah, you just, you pull that right out. And you might go in there and there may be no ice cream thing back there at all. And you, you swore there must have been, but it's not. Well, that's because you pulled out a pattern that was similar, but it's not the right thing. So we tend to pattern match things, you know, and that causes us a lot of trouble. You know, some of the Mandela effect is just a pattern matching effect. When you look at a word, you know, it, you, I don't know if you've seen it on the Internet, but there's a, there's a place on the Internet it comes around the internet every once in a while where there'll be a paragraph about maybe 10 lines or something. And what they've done is they took every word that was in that paragraph and they left the first two letters and the last two letters alone. And then they randomly mixed all the letters in between. And of course the question is, can you read this? Well, I read it. I read the whole thing with no trouble at all. And if you had asked me, did you find any misspelled words? 
I had said, no, everything looked fine. I read it and it's perfectly clear. No, I wasn't trying to edit it or, you know, look at it with that kind of detail. If I was, I would have found every word misspelled. But, well, I may be not. I'm not that great a speller. But uh, my spell checker would have found every word misspelled. Anyhow, when I looked at it, I could read them. It's pattern match. You get a, you get a pattern of what a word is. You see enough of that pattern, you just grab that and you go on. And you may have grabbed the wrong pattern because there may be several things that have the same first two letters and the last two letters, but they have different letters in between and they mean different things. And you could have done that. You know, you could have come up with the wrong pattern. Mm-hmm. So we we do that. You know, the, the, the Mandela people, the, I had a little conference with the Mandela uh, organization and I gave them like four different ways that consciousness can create, you know, a Mandela effect. And that was just one of them. Mm. It's, uh, but there are four different things to do it. And the last one, of course, is that sometimes the reality is just squirrely. The larger consciousness system may just, you know, it's a data stream you get. And if it wants to put little green men with pointy ears in your data stream, it can do that, you know, and that's what you'll see. And that will be your reality. And it will be just as physical as anything else because that's what we get. We get a data stream from the server. And we, as a free will awareness unit, we interpret that data to be our reality. And everybody lives in their own reality because everybody gets a data stream. There is no reality out there. You know, the Mandela effect has this assumption that there is a true reality out there that is some way, but it seems to change from now, you know, now and again. But part of that problem is that there is no reality out there there's only you know there's eight billion people here and there's eight billion different viewpoints of what reality is each one is individual but it's a multiplayer game so the the game shows us each you know shows you and i sitting where we are and connected because that's what we're doing now so uh, you know it's a multiplayer game any multiplayer game you get to see the same thing that other players are seeing. You all see the same monster in the same place. You're all engaged in the same battle, you know, that that sort of thing. So sure, there's lots of similarities, but everybody gets their own data stream. And if the system wants to put something squirrely in your data stream, well, your reality is just going to be different than anybody else's. And if it wants you to realize that this reality is more than just materialistic uh, machine, then it might just start putting some very different things in different people's realities just to cause a Mandela effect so that people say, you know, reality isn't as buttoned down as we thought. It's kind of goofy sometimes. Well, that just opens people's minds, and it's a thing the system would do just to help pry open people's minds so they have a little bigger picture. So uh, let's talk about the sort of computational boundary of the self within this avatar um, or Within this consciousness, I mean, we've got this avatar, it's got this consciousness, this reality is governed by information. At what point is this avatar or the player able to go beyond this avatar? So now we're heading into the territory of out of body experiences. Let's define out of body experience uh, because I've watched and I've listened to many of your podcasts. I see you, you've go through the history of it. If, for anyone who wants to listen to those, they can, the Bob Monroe Institute, all of that. But f- for this one, let's focus on the crux of the, of the topic. What is an out-of-body experience, and how does this occur? Out-of-body experience is most accurately described as a single-player game that's been handed to you by the LCS. So your reality is a data stream, and that data stream can describe this virtual reality that we call the physical universe but it doesn't have to. They can give you a data stream that describes something else. And that something else then becomes your reality. Okay. Now, that's the same thing we're talking about in the Mandela effect. You know, you're just getting a different data stream. Now, so if you, you can use meditation or you can maybe skip meditation and use your, your imagination. But if you get to the point that you let the physical world go, and what I mean by that, you ignore the data stream that's coming to you describing this physical universe. Okay, you just ignore it. So you don't process any of that data. Mostly people do that through meditation. 
They'll get into a meditation state, and they will stop processing physical data. And when they do, remember that point consciousness, all you are is a piece of consciousness, aware that you're aware. That's it. Well, when you get to that point, the larger conscious system can, if you want, if you intend to, you can get another data stream where you are out, flying around. You're in places. You're going different kind of places. And you think, well, I'd rather go over there, see what that is. And you fly over there, and you see what that is. And you run into people, and you interact with them. And you know, so you have this big experience. It's just a single-player game. You're now getting a data stream that's defining a different reality that is not this virtual reality. It's some other virtual reality that's being played for you. And that's all an out-of-body is. That's basically what your lucid dream is. Except one of them, you never lose consciousness. You go from awake in this reality to awake in another reality. And the other one, you lose consciousness first and then wake up and you're in a different reality. You're not in the physical reality anymore. So it's just kind of different entry process for each one, but it both takes you to the same place. Now, the thing about data streams is that you get a data stream. Your reality isn't that data stream. Your reality is your interpretation of that data stream. You get the data, but you have to interpret it. Now, interpreting it has some problems. It depends on your level of fear, your level of knowledge, your intellect, your you know everything, your emotions, all that defines you will impact and color how you interpret it. It and it and you have to interpret it into things, into metaphors that are physical for the most part. Because that's how you think. That's what your language does. Our language is a language that describes things physical. Well, not always. We can describe feelings. We can describe other things. So you'll have feelings. So you just, but you have to put it into the same context as which you put your interpretation of this physical matter reality, that virtual reality, because that's where your language is. That's where <laughs> your thoughts are. And without the language, you can't put your thoughts in any kind of an order to express them. If you can't express them, you can't express them to yourself either. Then they're just vague kind of feelings and things. And wow, that was really something, but I can't explain it. I, you know, I don't have any words for it. Well, that's because you don't have any patterns already in your system to match it to. So you just, you're lost there. But you match it to some pattern that you've already got. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, you match that to a pattern of a humanoid because that's what you usually talk to, this humanoid things. You don't talk to chickens. You don't talk to dogs. You don't talk to rocks. So you're having a conversation. You'll pattern that as a humanoid. And if you want to see who you're talking to, you'll see kind of a human shape. It'll have a head and arms and legs and probably be in a robe with a hood. So you don't have to conjure up all the detail unless you really want to. It just makes it simpler. And uh, so that's what you'll get. But you see, you'll see that as a person and you're having this conversation. And then you'll say, oh, I went to some place and I met this guy, George. And George told me all kinds of interesting things about where he lives. Okay, well, basically, the reason you saw George the way you saw him is because that was your best pattern match for somebody who will talk to you. George may have been a, you know, a, a three-headed uh, giraffe or something, but you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't have made that match. You wouldn't have interpreted it that way. So it's your interpretation of the data that you get. And your interpretation is colored by all kinds of things. So how do you get better is you, re, you develop the skills, again, that detaches you from all that stuff that's yours. You know, from, from all that fear and ideas and beliefs, and you try to get rid of all your beliefs, try to offload all your fear, you try to get as clean as possible, and then you want to be in a detached state where you're not thinking of anything and your mind is clear, and now your interpretation will be closer to what the data actually was giving you. You see? So again, there's people who are good at it and very good at it and not so good at it, 
But everybody thinks they're good at it. You know, everybody thinks that what they saw, that's what was there. There was this guy there and he had this robe on and he said the most amazing things. And here's what he said. You know, they'll say that, but that's, you have to realize that's their interpretation of what they got out of the data stream. If that data stream gives you things that you've got no pattern match at all for, you probably won't even remember it because you won't have any way to put it into a language that you can describe it to yourself. A lot of people do that. They'll go in, they'll get into a meditation space, they'll disappear for an hour, come back, and they don't have any idea what they did or where they've been. Well, part of that is that it wasn't anything that they could pattern match. They couldn't, they couldn't bring it back. It wasn't, you know, something they could bring back. So, and there's other reasons that you might get that too. But anyway, so that's what your reality is like. You tend to create your own reality in several ways. One way is how you interpret it. Okay, now if let's, let's say you're a depressed person. How you interpret your reality is everything sucks, everything is nasty, everybody is a problem. You know, all you'll see is negativity everywhere. And every if somebody comes up and real cheerily says, "Oh, hi, have a nice day," you'll think, "Oh, what a slob! He didn't mean that." You see, you'll just find something negative about it, and you won't see that that was some nice person just being nice. You'll see it as just some jerk who says stuff that he doesn't really mean. So you interpret it. And it works the other way. If you're very positive, you, know, you interpret everything as being positive. So your life gets to be really good and happy because even if something awful happens, you go, oh, well, it's a good opportunity for me to learn something. All right. How, you know, what's the best solution for that? What's, what's my best choice? And you see it as a, as a challenge and a puzzle. And that's, growing that's even fun so mm. even though it's something terrible that happened you turn it around and make something positive out of it it's an opportunity so then you say how's life and you say it's great everything's positive i'm learning i'm growing i'm you know i'm doing things well so you see it's just a lot of what your reality is comes from you so in that way you you don't create the data stream that comes to you. So you don't create your reality that way. You, cre you create your own reality as much as you get to interpret that data in whichever way that it represents you. The other way you can, you can uh, uh, modify your reality is with an intent to modify the probability distributions. That's another way you can change your reality. Um, Tom, you guys have done Any. some fascinating work. I mean, with the Bob Monroe Institute and all this, the things you've done in your career. I think the logical question from all of this is, is can we test, let's say, out-of-body experiences, can we test these, this access to information? And I, I mean, I know yeah. you've done work on this, but I'm just asking it in that way so that people yeah. can deeper understand yeah. it. If you want an objective test, test that's, that a physicist would say, that's solid data, Hmm. No, you won't do that because everything's in the subjective world. The objective world doesn't explain things in the subjective world. That's it's just the nature. The two of those things are different. Subjective means it happens in your own mind. It's your it's your attitude. It's your feeling. It's the it's, you know that is not susceptible to an objective test. Now you can make some objective tests. You can hook them up to a to an EEG and watch the brain waves. You can hook them up to an MRI or something and look at the look at the the uh, heat or blood flow in their brain. And you know you've seen those kind of patterns of people and and you can find similarities there and say, oh look, this lobe just lit up. That means they're thinking about things, but exactly what they're thinking about isn't going to be clear. You know, so some general things you can you can monitor. But from somebody to come back and say, oh, I talked to some guy, his name was Fred, and, uh, you know, he had a robe on, and he told me all these wonderful things. There's no way that the objective work is going to say, oh, that was just a lot of crap. Now, they'll, they'll say that anyway, just because they figure anything that isn't objective is undefined and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, a load of crap. But 
they won't say that from knowledge. That's just their belief. But it may not be a load of crap because when the, it probably isn't. The reason it's important is that the larger conscious system is trying to raise its own quality of consciousness. It's trying to, you know, lower its entropy. Mm-hmm. We are part of its strategy for doing that. Therefore, it has incentive to be helpful to us, to help us succeed. So it's not an uninterested party that just says, okay, you you know, go do whatever you do, leave me alone. It's not like that. It has a vested interest in us succeeding and growing up. So when you do an out of body and the system sends you a data stream, that data stream isn't just something to entertain you. The system's not interested in entertaining you. It's something that will help you grow up. It's something that will teach you something. You just have to find a lesson in it. You see? So when you, if you do a lot of out of body and you pay attention, then you'll learn a lot and you will grow up for it because that out of body experience was meant to help you grow up. So to say that, well, we couldn't, couldn't measure it directly from the objective world. So it's meaningless. It's not meaningless at all. On that intuitive side, there's lots of meaning on that intuitive side. Uh, there's lots of significance. We already said that. You know, the most significance and meaning in your life is on that side. That's where meaning and significance lives. And if you get that through consciousness, then it can be very meaningful. But now let's say that on your intuitive side, you're not very skilled at it. So the fact that you can create information and then feed that information back to you Well, you may have made it all up. That guy you saw and what he said, that was something you could have made up entirely. Or you could have been getting that from some other person. Some other consciousness could have been feeding you that information. Now, that's the most unlikely because we don't sit around and try to feed information like that to other people. So that's a very low probability. But the other two aren't so low that you can make it up yourself or it can come from the larger consciousness system. And the bad news is there's no tag on that the various sources. You know, those three sources don't come with a little tag that says, oh, this is from you, and this is from the larger consciousness system. It's just data, because sometimes it's a mixture. You get stuff from the larger consciousness system, and then because it triggers some of your own stuff, you start adding or subtracting and putting stuff in it, Um, you know, that happens most of the time. So when you get somebody who's writing a book about his out of body experiences, you're seeing some of what he got in his data stream and you're seeing a lot of what his reaction to that stuff came, comes out of his own self and what he turns it into and his pattern matches of what comes out of it and his metaphors to explain it are all his. So you have to kind of read between the lines, see what was really going on there. And some of the time you just can't tell, you know, where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. That's again, it depends on the practitioner. You can be very good at separating those three, you know, those three different sources. You can be just with experience. You learn, they feel different. They come at you different ways. They have different tone, different color to them, you know, so you can separate them. If you're not very experienced, you can't separate them. They're all the, they all look like exactly the same thing, but you can never, even with a lot of experience, separate them with, with no uncertainty. There'll always be some uncertainty because the larger consciousness system is clever enough to be able to mimic things that will set you off to be one thing when it's not, mm-hmm. you know, it's, you can't say, oh, well, I know that came from another source. You don't know that for sure. It seems that way. It's the way the other source usually is, but the larger conscious system is the master of everything because it's in charge of the, you know, it's creating the reality. It can do what it will. It wants to help you learn and it will give you things that give you opportunities to learn. It can't make you learn. You have to find the opportunity and then learn from it. You know, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but you know, a lot of, a lot of young guys, when they're in their twenties and thirties and going into their forties, they go out of body and all they do is fight. 
you know, they have the, they have the sword of truth and you know, there's, they're the good guys. And then there's the evil people and they spend all their time fighting evil. Well, why is that? It's because they're young guys and, and guys are protectors. They're the ones that go out and fight evil. You know, that's kind of their role. It's the way they see reality. It's the way they see themselves. And most of all the, all the evil that they fight is evil that they create. Those images are mostly coming out of their own mind because they're going out there looking to vanquish evil. That's kind of the mindset they have. Well, what do they see? Oh, there's all kinds of evil things all over. And those things are a, a combination of what the system gives them, which isn't that much, and mostly it's what they create. It's how they, how they see evil. So they spend a lot of time out, you know, hacking, hacking evil and making the world and the non-physical a better place for everyone. <coughs> when the lesson is to let go of that, that the fighting isn't the, mm. not the way, you know, and that uh, they learn that there's always another evil thing there. You know, it's not like after they're done, ah, now the non-physical world is all peaceful and it's going to stay that way forever. Nope, there's always another evil thing there because they're going out to fight evil things. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it's kind of an endless, they're in an endless loop there. And eventually they're supposed to outgrow it, get tired of it, and look for something more meaningful and let it go. And when they do, then they've grown up a little bit. Mm. So the system will, it will tailor stuff to you and your own interests and will give you things that will help you learn. But it's not going to tell you something. It's not going to say, hey, put your sword down and, and go think of some other way, you know, to be helpful. Mm. It's not all it's not all about fighting. It's not all about you know power and force. Force isn't the main way you change things. It's by force. Mostly <laughs> by force. You either keep things the same or you make things worse. You know, that's that's the typical typical result of force. Mm. And they have to they have to come to that Tom, before, themselves in their own way. With that with that nice background in mind. Tom, tell me, uh -huh. oh, what did you guys do? I mean, because you guys have done so much work over time. What was the thought process behind trying to test these out-of-body ex body experiences? And what were the results for all of those who are not familiar with your work? Well, first of all, we used the out-of-body almost exclusively to do things that were evidential. And let's like say Dennis and I would go out and we'd get in the bed and mm. we would spend probably two thirds of our time doing things evidential and another third of our time just going out and experiencing what we could experience, you know, just kind of exploring. Mm. And that's because you don't get any evidence that what you're doing is real when you just go out and explore because it's, you know, there's no feedback there. It's either. You know, you either did or you created it or you never know. So what we did is we spent most of our time doing things like remote viewing. You immediately get your answer is what you saw, what was actually there. Uh, a healing, because now well, that's medicine. So you only get information about how well you did after you've done hundreds of people. You know, you get a sense and some are never evidential like, oh, I worked on somebody's headache and it went away. Well, so what? It might have just gone away anyway. You know, headaches come and go. You have to, but if you worked on 100 people with headaches and 98 of them went away immediately, well, now that's different. You know, that, that's that got some kind of statistical significance to it. And if you worked on somebody who had a chronic illness and was all bent over and twisted up and hadn't been able to walk for, you know, 20 years, They've been in a wheelchair, had to be pushed around because their body wasn't able to get out and walk. And you worked on them. And, you know, the next day after you worked on them, they got up, danced a jig and, you know, went out, took a stroll in the park. Well, now that's evidential, even though it was just a one-off because something very, very unusual happened. You did something that was probably a one in a million that it would, or one in a trillion even that it would have taken place. So after, what, 
20, 30 years of doing this, you come up with enough statistics that will convince you that it's real. You are really affecting people and you can modify future probability. You can interact with, with entities and things that make sense, give you information that's valuable, teach you things. And you learn that often it's not what the, the, the lesson isn't so much in what an entity might tell you as it is in how you handled the interaction, how you got there, how good were you at, at uh, being uh, completely detached? How good were you at keeping your own stuff out of it? Because the conscious system, when you're out of body, will feed you a link and they'll feed you stuff that resonates with your own problems, with your own issues, just to see for you to practice, you know, being, you know, not letting your issues interfere. So it gives you practice for that. And so the fact, the actual, the actual interaction wasn't what was important. What was important was that the lesson gave you practice at honing your control over your own consciousness. And control is not the right words. Your, your ability to, to make your consciousness more efficient and more useful to you. So some of it were just lessons. And, you know, you don't realize that in the beginning. It's only with some perspective later that you, you know, understand those things. But Dennis and I did a lot of remote viewing. We would be in the booths and Bob would go over and write numbers down on a, on a chalkboard. And we were supposed to tell him what the numbers were. Um, we would go to friends' houses and things and see what they were doing and, you know, try to pick up something unusual. You know, oh, yeah, you were sitting on the couch watching TV. Well, yeah, that's what they do every night. You know, that doesn't mean anything. You know, well, what was that? I saw something bright red right in the middle of right in the middle of your bed. You had some, you know, it's just this big splash of bright red right in the middle of your bed. And you call them up and, and the lady would say, oh, yeah, I just just today I bought a new pair of red shoes and I had them sitting in the middle of the bed. Well, bingo, you see, you got that right. You didn't necessarily see they were shoes, but you got the color. And so we look for unusual things like that. And again, if you do that over years, you do it thousands of times, you start to develop a sense of, of the capability of that these things are true and real. So it's not something you'll get right away. It's not like you can practice this for a week and you'll know whether it's you know real or not. It takes a long time with a lot of data. But eventually you'll get past the point of trying to discover, is it real? Some point for me, I was probably a couple of, couple of years into Bob and Rose thing, been on hundreds of out of bodies and whatever. And, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm hard to convince of things like that. You know, in my mind, eh, you know, it's, it's a mental thing, you know, maybe, yeah, I don't know what it was, but, you know, maybe there is some other explanation for it, you know, so I'm hard to convince, but I was convinced I got to that point where I didn't have to ask, is it real anymore, when Dennis and I both went out together on, a, on an out-of-body thing, and we stayed with each other, and we both saw the same things, we discussed things, we had conversations, and here we were in two isolation booths where we couldn't hear each other, couldn't see each other, we were totally isolated. Actually, there are three booths there, and I was in the first one. He was in the last one, so it was an empty booth between us, and all of them were acoustically isolated. The one I was in was electromagnetically isolated. It was a Faraday cage, and, and uh, we were having conversations, answering each other's questions, uh, looking at things, having, you know, whatever, because Bob had us report all the things that happened, and he was um, recording both of those. Back in those days, it was on cassettes, and he recorded all that stuff. So he had a cassette for me and a cassette for Dennis, and he, he rewound them when we came out, and he started them both at the same time so that they would be, you know, they would be synced in time. And he played both of them at the same time, and here we were. We were obviously together, and we obviously were talking, met the same people, heard the same things, you know, so we had a out-of-body together. So. Exist, Tom? Hmm? Do these tapes still exist? I have looked for them. Bob had them, and I suspect that they were probably 
kind of special to Bob, and he probably put him in some you know special place so he wouldn't get lost. But you know, there was literally thousands and thousands of tapes. I can imagine. And at the time, at the time. There wasn't a whole lot of care about what was done with him. There was a great big box in a closet. And Bob taped everything, every session for everybody, no matter if they just walked in off the street. And it was the first time that, you know, he, he taped everything. He was collecting data. But cassettes were pulled out and thrown in a box, you know, thrown in a box, thrown in a box. Pretty soon the box has a thousand cassettes in it. And one day, I think after Bob was probably passed on, all those tapes were gathered up and they got the box and they went through them and tried to listen to everyone and categorize it and who was it and what were they doing. And they put a lot of effort into trying to squeeze entropy out of that, that mess of tapes. And what they found was two things. One, some of them were really hard to tell, you know, they were hard to figure out what was going on. So those just weren't, you know, they never went anywhere. Some of them, the tapes were too old because Bob had been, you know, he'd been collecting his tapes for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. A lot of time. He, he had a lot of, a lot of tapes, you know, he'd been collecting. There's more than one box, I suspect. But uh, anyhow, there were so many of them, those tapes, and he always bought the cheapest tapes possible because he went through so many of them. Bob was a little stingy on things like that, and he would uh, he'd go to Radio Shack and he'd get tapes that cost uh, you know a dollar a piece or something. Really good cassettes were like five dollars a piece, but he he'd buy a, a box of fifty, you know, such that there were you know seventy five cents a piece or something. So he was saving money, but he didn't think about how long they'd last. Those cheap tapes were in very cheap plastic, uh, you know, cassettes. And I'd say that a fair number of them just were too old, too brittle, didn't, you know, they just didn't play anymore. You'd start to play them and the tape would, would fall apart. Would yeah. So they did have a lot of them. And if you go to the Monroe system, you can look up tapes. You can listen to me when I'm, when I was in that booth, they've got some of my tapes in there, but those particular tapes never showed up. And my guess is that Bob probably has set them aside because they were kind of amazing. And they got, who knows, you know, after his death, who knows what happened? Maybe they just cleaned it out, threw them in a garbage bag. You know, it's hard to say. There were so many tapes laying everywhere that, uh, like a needle in a haystack. But they have tried. I've asked them to go back and look again. And they have really cooperated and put a lot of effort in. And they just can't find that. They didn't dig it out. But. Dennis is still alive. He's still, he's a little older than me, but he's still, uh, kicking too. So <laughs> he, he remembers it as well. But other than that, no, that, uh, unfortunately those tapes don't exist anymore. When you look back, what do you think Bob's intention for all this research and what, what is the overarching theme and goal? Well, there's several different ones. Bob's was to try to make his out-of-body experience legitimate. Mm. He had these out-of-body experiences, and he knows most people looked at him and said, that's just your imagination. You know, that's, these are dreams you're having and, and uh, whatever. Most people blew it off as, as uh, non-consequential, didn't really mean anything, had no significance. Mm. And Bob knew that it did because he had done things and, and collected information, you know, our remote viewing wasn't just lying in the bed and having our mind go remote view. We'd go out of body and with our out of body, we would go someplace and look at things and, and, and then come back and see whether what we said. So it was, it was that kind of a thing. So Bob knew that he had seen things, gathered information that was just impossible for him to have and that he found it was correct. So he was convinced that it was absolutely true. And he didn't try to do a lot of analysis in his books. His books were like a journal. Here's what I experienced. He didn't try to say, and I interpret it, you know, this is my interpretation and this is what I think it meant. He just said, this is what I experienced. And that was good because he didn't really know how to interpret it or what it meant. 
but he wanted to learn more. So he, his motivation was he wanted it to become more legitimate, more science, you know, research. He wanted it, enough people doing it to catalog it that you could find things that were similar and, and trends. And then he found, you know, we, we found the binaural beats and had a really nice tool. And then suddenly he saw a, a business opportunity. So then, you know, shortly after that, he created, uh, you know, TMI, you know, the Monroe Institute and had people coming and it began to pay for itself because it all the first bunch of years, Bob funded everything. Everything came out of Bob's pocket and it didn't give anything back. You know, it was just his interest to find out. So he found something that would, that would give back and maybe even have a little left over, you know, pay for staff and other things. And that was good. It kind of raised the whole game to a little higher level. The more research you could, you could hire somebody just to do research. You know, so that's what TMI then started teaching courses and doing other things once they got a sound that was really helpful for most people. So that was his, his idea. Now, mine was very different. I'm a, I'm a physicist. What physics does is tries to model reality. We try to understand how does reality work? What is reality and how does it work? That's basically what physics is all about. So my motivation I didn't really care so much whether anybody thought I was crazy or not that, or whether they, you know, Bob did, he didn't want to be seen as crazy. He wanted it to be legitimate. I didn't really care what other people thought. I wanted to understand it. I wanted to, to understand why is it like that? Okay. This works and that works, but why, and why are they limits? And why do you heal some people and not others? And why do you sometimes get your remote remote viewing wrong? And what are the parameters involved? How significant is your altered state or the preparation that you do going into it? Or can you skip all that stuff? So I had just thousands of questions that wanted to scientifically find out what was going on. So my whole point in it was find a model, find a way to describe it. So I tried looking at the literature, you know, and we'd you know, read everything that I could find written about it. And most of it was junk. It wasn't, you know, there was very little science or stuff that actually looked like facts to me. And the, the one book I got that seemed like it had an idea, but it was missing an awful lot of, of stuff was Seth Speaks. Seth Speaks came out in the early 70s, and I read that. And, you know, a lot of the stuff he said was correct. You know, it was... You know, we live in a multidimensional reality. We are fundamentally consciousness. We, you know, and he had all these things. And I said, oh, that's check, check, check. But then there was other things he said that didn't check and whatever. So that was a, that was at least a start, but certainly not a finish. You know, at least I found somebody that had some idea of what it was like, but not very satisfactory in the big picture. So I just kept working on it. And after I left the Monroe, Monroe kind of went off, you know, on his direction. And I went off in my own direction, moved out of that state, went someplace else. And uh, I just kept working at it all the time. You know, every night, you know, times I had, you know, I go to bed, I do a meditation state and I start doing, doing things, you know, well, okay, I can understand this part, but I can't understand what this variable has to do with it. But I know when I change this variable, it changes these things. So what's going on? What's the model? So given about 30 years of that research, I finally got to the point I thought I understood how consciousness worked. And that's when I wrote my books. My books were really a model of consciousness. But I also knew that consciousness was fundamental and the physical world was not. And therefore, physics had to be derivable from an understanding of consciousness because consciousness is fundamental and the physics has to come out of that. So it wasn't until about two or three years after my books were published that I made that connection and got the aha to understand how physics would be derived from that. So it took a while. I've been learning things ever since, you know, I, I, I keep figuring new things out all the time. So it's uh, the books have been published now for 20 years. Yeah. You know, I, they were February 
2003 they were published and now we're almost uh, 23 you know so are you planning on writing a future books tom anything in the well i do have a future book uh, that i've been working on that people keep asking me how's it coming and it's not doing very well because i'm so busy i don't have time mm. my writing of books i have mm. to sit down and have big blocks of time where i'm not you know mm. I'm, I'm not interrupted and I'm not engaged in doing other things else, but I'm not like that right now. I've got, you know, 20 things to do and I don't have the time to do them all. I'm in a constant, you know, on the treadmill running, trying to catch up to the things that I have to do. So I'm not writing any books now, but it, the, t the, the name of it is maybe surprise you. And that is primal man, primal woman. Hmm. It's a book. It's a book about gender. And essentially if you can strip off, all the cultural overlays and just look at male and female in their primal state without this culture saying this is good and that's bad and so on. just take all that cultural stuff away from it what do you have in male and female what what are they how do they you know how are they the same how do they differ what is the you know what is the relationship and how does it work and i've written about 20 pages which was just a a brief outline so that people would get a little idea of where it was going. And that's at my website. I think you can go get that at the, read that at the website, but that's maybe 5% or 10%. You know, I've got a whole lot more in my head and I continue to work on it all the time. You know, I get new insights and kind of learn new things and come to conclusions, but I just haven't written any of it down. What's I just wrote that, that little bit. This topic at the moment. What's what? What's drawn you towards this topic? Oh, what's drawn me toward that topic is that the reason I felt compelled to write MBT in the first place about consciousness is I saw that there was the great majority of people in my culture and probably world culture had no idea why they were here, what they were supposed to be doing the nature of the reality they lived in, mm. <laughs> the, the nature of the game that they were involved in. They're all wandering around, as I say, clueless, you know, in the playing field, not having any idea what the game was. That most of our dysfunction, you know, power, control, force, greed, all that stuff, most of that dysfunction was because they didn't understand the nature of reality and how things worked. And that if I could if I could spread that information about what is consciousness and what's it trying to do and you know, where's it going and what are you really? Then I thought it would change the world in the sense that we would produce a kinder, gentler, more supportive, more sustainable, uh, world. And as we grew up, we would also be better caretakers of the environment and of each other. So I thought, that that information was sorely needed. People needed to understand the bigger picture that they were in and why. And it's not just that, oh, love is the answer. That's sweet. That's nice. But, you know, it's just a saying that people say because it sounds nice, but it doesn't really mean anything. Really, the words, you know, the world is a, is a, very, a very rough, very tough, existence where everybody's trying to do control power force on everybody else and it's a mean place it's the mean streets and it doesn't have to be that way we create it that way that's our creation because that's what we are that's it's all the grown what the more grown we are so i saw that in the bigger picture people now would not be able to go to a place if they didn't have a logical scientific roadmap to get there. You know, back what a thousand years ago, the high priests of our culture were priests and it was religion that told people what was right and what was wrong and what to believe and what not to believe. And a lot of that turned out to be control power and force as well. But I knew that just to paint a pretty picture, you know, we could all just get along better. It'd be nice. It's totally ineffectual. That doesn't do anything. That's not going to help anybody. Everybody go, uh-huh, uh-huh, but that's not the kind of world it is, Tom, you know, join the real world. But if they actually understood what this reality was about, the game they were in, how it works, why it works that way, 
Now, that's a logical scientific approach that people could buy into because it made sense. It explained things. And it not only explained things in, you know, philosophy, you know, who cares about philosophy, but it explained a lot of things in physics and in science and cleared up a lot of problems across the board. All sorts of things made sense, like quantum mechanics and relativity and and uh, things evolving faster than randomness would allow. And I mean, there's these zillions of things that happen in our world that have no explanation. Even simple things like particles tunneling out of into spaces they shouldn't be allowed to be in, you know, these kinds of things. And, oh, yeah, we understand it's part of our science. Sure, they do this. Well, we know they do this, but we have no idea exactly why that works. And there's a lot of things that we're not sure of. We don't know how why quantum mechanics works. So quantum mechanics will explain the tunneling, but you can't explain quantum mechanics. <laughs> you know? So you still really don't know how the tunneling works. You just have this explanation of it, but that's, you know, so it's that sort of thing. Tell me, were so you so many th- always a, an idealist or were you at some point a materialist who just converted the thought was? I was, well, you know, I started life and I was uh, kind of right brained, intuitive. And uh, I was not real intellectual. I was more holistic. Mm-hmm. I knew that what I needed to do while I was here was going to require me to get my left brain, you know, uh, honed up. So I, I knew I wanted to do things like in science and, you know, technical things like that. I was poor. I was one of the kids that had a pension of taking everything apart, you know, whatever I was around, you know, flashlights, any little things around, I'd take them all apart and see what all the pieces did. And, put them back together and take them apart again. So I like causality, how things worked. I was drawn to that. But when I finally got there in school, in college, I found math really, really hard because that's not the way I thought. I thought in big picture terms, not in little logical, you know, logical process terms. But I just kept working at it until I got good at it. Eventually, I got it and everything sunk in and then it got to be easy. You know, but it was not easy to begin with. So in the beginning, I was more right brain, more holistic, uh, big picture. Then I turned into more left brain, more uh, materialistic. And when I was in graduate school, I would have agreed with the idea that reality uh, is best defined by, uh, what do they call it? It's the... uh, It'll come up to me in a minute. But anyway, if you can't measure it, it really doesn't matter. Anything that's that's real is measurable. In other words, you have to be able to interact with it. That's what I mean by measure. You have to be able to physically interact with it in some way. If you've got something and there's no way to physically interact with it, then that doesn't belong in science. (laughs) That belongs somewhere else. And all of that stuff we throw into somewhere else really is a bunch of nonsense anyway. You know, that kind of a attitude. <coughs> so, yes, that was a standard materialist viewpoint. Yeah. That's and then in graduate school, I had this thing where I could, you know, I could debug, <coughs> debug code paranormally. And that kind of changed my mind. And I said, oh, well, this is some really firm evidence that there is something else going on here besides the physical stuff. What do you and mean? Then I, what do you mean like you could debug code paranormally? <coughs> Oh, I don't know. You hadn't heard that story. Hmm. I uh, found out in graduate school that I, first I learned to meditate. I learned to meditate so I wouldn't have to get so much sleep because that's what they advertised on their brochure. How do you say that? You could get, I'm not sure if I've heard these, this part. Well, I was in graduate school. I saw the sign. It was on the physics building door, and I opened it up, and it said, learn to meditate. Hmm. $25 for students. It was transcendental meditation. $25 for students. So, they said, here's the things, you know, be more relaxed, you know, get more energy, not have to sleep as much, da, 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 da. and I got that not have to sleep as much because I was a graduate student doing, doing, you know, working with a, doing in what we call experimental physics with a big Van de Graaff generator that shooting particles that smashed and keeping track of the pieces. And I was doing that. And, and when that machine was working, you stayed there and took data. 
because it didn't work that long before it broke down. You know, it was a very complicated machine and it was old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the thing was, the thing was working and the data was flowing, you know, you might not get sleep for two or three days. You just have to drink coffee and, and, and take pop uh, caffeine pills and whatever you had to do, get your friends to come in and, and help you take the data, that kind of thing. Because, it's not like, well, I'll go home and come back in the morning and start it up again. <laughs> no, that's about a 10% chance that would work. When you start it up again, there'll be a problem or something or with something. So anyway, so I, I like that idea of not sleeping so much. So I paid my $25 and took a banana, which was required to uh, some guy who gave me a mantra. And it just was simple. You know, the very first time I sat down, after he gave me the mar, mar, the mantra, I disappeared for about 45 minutes and didn't know where. You know, I, I thought like maybe 10, 15 minutes had gone by and almost an hour had gone by. So I said, wow, that's interesting. And the more I did it, the better I got at it. And one day I was just in a, you know, they say meditate twice a day for half an hour. That was the, that was the rules. So I was doing my half an hour thing. And I was thinking about, my mind wasn't very focused. I was thinking about my, my work, you know, the, I was, had to write my own code because all the science is done these days on a computer, you know, so I, and I was back in the days of punch cards. That's how you put stuff into the computers is on punch cards. You'd get a thing back, you'd throw in your punch cards and it either bomb or it would, it would run. And when it bombed, there were no error messages. There's no thing that told you, oh, it was this line was the problem. You know, you didn't get any of that in those days. What you got was a message that your job bombed. That's all the information you got. So then you have these card decks of like uh, 2000 cards. And I had like two boxes. So I had 4000 cards and uh, they're all in decks. And of course it matters what order they're in. You can't mess any of the orders up of these cards because they're statements. Each card is a statement in a program. And uh, so I was just thinking about thing bombing, I was having trouble figuring out what the problem was, where were the errors. And as I th said that, a picture of my printout was up here, it's like on a scroll, and it's just rolling down in front of me. And I could see the printout because I wrote every line of code, so I knew, you know, I could look at it and tell exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And then here would be a line that was in red, and I'd note it. I'd say, okay, that's an error, right? Mm -hmm. I got the idea, yeah, that's an error. So I looked at that code. and. I could remember it, you know, I, like I say, I wrote every line of it. So I knew what every line was and I found, I found another one and I found about four of them mm -hmm. and one of them was not an error in the coding I had done. It was an error in the key punch. The hole in the card was just a little bit off. So that couldn't have been something that was in my mind. The other ones, maybe my subconscious said that, it, it remembered that I didn't put that comma after the, you know, the, you know, this term or something that it needed in a bomb because it got to that point and there was no comma there or no semicolon, but that was a key punch error. Nothing I did. And I took it in and, and it, cause I couldn't find anything wrong with it. So I took it in and repunched it and it worked fine. And I held the two cards up and you know, one of them was about a you know, half a millimeter off. So. You know, those are big, just mechanical devices. They, they move around and change some, you know, with use. So I realized that this was information from elsewhere, nothing I could possibly have known. And that to me, I'm a physicist, I model reality. And my thoughts was, wow, there's another whole bunch of reality that I didn't even know existed, but it's there. So, in that so that's where I. So that was the so that, that really converted you to the idealistic. Yeah. So then when I, I saw that, I said, well, okay, if you can measure it, that puts it in this section of our reality, but there's another part of our reality that can't be measured because this was just mental. You know, all of this was just going on in my mind. And yet I had information I couldn't possibly have known that there was a key punch error there. That's just impossible. And that would have been a tough one to find too. So anyway. Yes, I, at that time, then uh, I was very positive about it. And I said, well, there's another part of reality that is not physical. 
And that is very meaningful because I get this right information. You know, it's got rules. See, that's the way physics is, think about things. It's got rules. It's got structure. It's not just random, you know, it's not just a random field of information floating around. It obviously has structure. And for some reason, I got the information that I was thinking about. I was intending. My intent was, what's wrong? What's wrong in this thing? Well, that's a query to the database. Uh, I know that now. I didn't know that then. So the fact that I saw my data and it started scrolling down and I saw the red things, well, that was an answer to my question. So, you know, I, I knew that there was something else going on in the mind that didn't have anything to do with physical reality. But I didn't know what, I didn't know how, I didn't know why, I didn't know anything other than that it was true. And then I, run, I, go, to, I go get a job and my boss hands me Bob and Rose's book. Yes, yeah, I've heard this story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I eventually go out and I meet Bob. Mm. And Bob just built a building to, you know, to try to study out of body. And I said, I'm in, I'm in, you know, I want to learn because I know there's something going on out there and I'm very interested, but I also was very skeptical. And I thought, well, if this turns out just to be a, you know, yeah. not very productive, then I'm, I'm out of here. But if it's something that actually helps me understand the things I know to be true, which is that there is more to reality than the physical, then wow, a great opportunity to learn and I'm going to get as much out of it as I could. So which aspect that was of that journey specifically with the TMI and Bob working with Bob, are you most proud, proud of in terms of your guys work? Well, the thing that had probably the biggest effect was Dennis and I coming up with the with the uh, binaural beat because that changed everything. Suddenly it went from just a couple of people trying to figure things out by themselves to a whole bunch of people getting involved. It's just actually better, you know, in the, in the long run, what but it turned into, about? turned into a business and that wasn't so good because then we weren't doing research anymore. We were, we were, you know, event, you know, we, we were going out doing events everywhere and that's not really what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be figuring out how does this thing work? But I did, and I did a lot of experiments while I was there. You know, I, one of the things I learned that was, that was, that I, I'm really glad I did, I guess, proud of, I would say. And that is that you don't have to go through the fog to get there. I had this idea that you get into an, in, you enter, you, you meditate and you let the physical go and you kind of, it disappears out in the fog and it's not there and you get foggier and foggier because I heard people say that it's just like falling asleep, but not losing consciousness. So I thought I had to get down into this right on the edge of, you know, losing consciousness and somewhere there was the transition right on the edge of consciousness. So I'd get down to this place that was, I say foggy. It's not that there's really fog there, but your mental, your mental capacity was just, just minimal, just a thread of awareness still left. And that was the place. Then I could go from there and take that back out to being out of body. So I had to always go to out of body through the fog. And I'd get in this fog area, and after a couple of minutes, the fog would clear, and I'd be someplace else. So I never lost consciousness, but I had to start going through the fog. And sometimes the, the uh, out-of-body thing was a little unclear and a little foggy itself. Then one day I discovered, and this was a, just a, a hunch I had, that the fog was unnecessary, that that was just a belief I had that it had to go down into the fog to get rid of the physical. So I said, well, I'll just start just being wide awake. Let's start. I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to lie here. And then I'm going to start doing all the same things I did when I was, went through the fog, except I'm not going to go there first. Here I am wide awake, and now I'm going to go heal. And I'm going to remote view, and I'm going to do all these evidential things. And I found out it worked just as well. It worked just as well, if not better, because I didn't need all that time wasted in you know, relaxing this, relaxing that, you know, going through the fog deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, and all of that was just, was ritual. It was ritual to get your mind set in a place that, you know, you could do what you needed to do. So, prior so then I let go of the ritual and then I knew I could, I could go out of body in a half a second. Hmm. All you have to do is just shift your intent, shift your, you know, the, your data stream. It was just that simple. And suddenly it just got easier. 
and I could do things while I did other things. I could go out of body and talk to somebody at the same time, you know? And so I started developing a lot more robustness instead of having this very delicate state that you had to get into and hold, you know, so that you could do this, I could, I could do it almost anywhere, anytime. So that was a big breakthrough for me is that it didn't require the fog. All you had to do was take at least a part of your mind. I could parallel process it, but I could take a part of my mind attached to a different data stream. And fog was not essential to the process. Neither was relaxation, really. It was just you had to be able to have a mental discipline that separated parts of your mind that, you know, kept your own business out of what, you know, of what you were doing and so on. And I practiced those kinds of things. So that was kind of a big moment, a big moment for me, a kind of an aha moment that meant a lot. Um, other than that, doing this work with MBT, mm -hmm. when I first started writing the book, I thought I understood consciousness, but four or five, six times along that path of writing the book, I realized this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't know how to get from A to B. I can't do that logically. You know, it's like, you know, you've seen the, the, the joke, you know, where the guy's writing all this math on the board and then there's a little arrow and on the arrow it says, and then a miracle occurred, you know, and then you start someplace else. You know, it's sort of like that joke. I said, this won't do, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to lead people intellectually and rationally to a better space where they can be more productive and, and less negative, I can't have these places where and then a miracle occurred. It has to be logical all the way. So then I just spent time working on that problem and working on that problem until I solved it. And I did. I eventually I solved all the problems and then I wrote the book. But uh, when I thought I knew what I was doing, I really didn't. There was a lot of, I realized there's a lot of fuzzy thinking that we tend to do, particularly if we're talking, if it's a verbal thing. But when you force yourself to write it down, Writing requires a lot more specificity. You have to say exactly what you mean, and you can't say things that are fuzzy because when you write down stuff that's fuzzy, it's just obviously fuzzy. <laughs> it sticks right out like a sore thumb, whereas in your mind, you're saying, yeah, well, it's sort of like this, and yeah, okay, and then we go, you know, you just kind of gloss over stuff. So writing it down was very important for me to force me into logical clarity. And... Uh, that took, my writing the book took five years. You know, I spent five years and a lot of that was figuring out the things that I hadn't really figured out or thought I had, but they weren't really figured out far enough yet. And in that process, the figuring that out, I came up with the model of information. It's all information, you know, like slap yourself in the head and say, well, of course it's information. You know, what else? are you aware of other than information? Look, you know, I feel, I hear, what is that? It's all just information. Consciousness is nothing more than information. And then that kind of got me to the next step, to the next step. And eventually I had it all together and wrote, wrote the books, mm. but it was a, and, and it was a long, from, from an informational perspective, what, what did these binaural beats do? What do they exhibit? What, what exactly is occurring when someone's listening to this? Okay. A binaural beat, is the beat that you hear because the beat frequency is taking place inside your head. Now, a beat frequency, as you know, if I have a pure tone here and another pure tone over here and in the air, a speaker, you know, and I put a pure, by pure tone, I mean a single frequency. So I have a single frequency here and a single frequency here. They'll be exactly the same. And there's a resonance. I can, these are tuning forks, let's say. The things that are tuning forks, okay? And that gives you a certain vibration because of the dimensions of the fork. So I can just hit this fork, and this one will start to vibrate too because it's tuned to that vibration. So that's a, a resonance. You can think this one, the other one will go because it picks up that. It's, it's made to resonate at that frequency if they're both in the same frequency. Now, if I have one of these, let's say it's 100 hertz, and this one is 104, and I ting them both, they will beat. There'll be a beat frequency of four hertz. So four hertz is something like wah, 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 wah. You know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You have to say one, two, three, four in a second. You know, it's four beats per second. 
So every second, if you can say one, two, three, four, that's how fast they go. So it's kind of one, 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 one. You know, that's a four hertz beat. That's because the sounds mix and where they mix, where the waves superimpose, you know, on each other, where the peaks come together, you get a louder sound. Where the peaks are opposite, you don't get any sound, so you get a beat. The louder sounds the beat, and then it's a frequency because it goes to zero in between. So that's what the beat frequency is. So that takes place in air. It'll take place in any medium in which the two waves meet. Okay, you could put these in a piece of metal. You could both put a pure tone in this end of a steel bar and a pure tone in that end, and, and you'd hear the beat frequencies coming out of the, you know, of the, of the bar as those two waves process down the, the metal. So what happens is you put a pure tone in this ear and a pure tone in this ear. They get to the corpus callosum, which is the membrane between the two hemispheres, and they meet down there, and they cause a beat. The signals actually interact with each other at the corpus callosum. And what the, this guy Oster, who wrote an article in Scientific American, said that it's been shown that that drives brain frequency, you know, an EEG. You put an EEG on, and you look at all the different frequencies that are being emitted, and then you do this binaural beat at 4 hertz. You're seeing that the brain waves. Oh, they're all over the place, you know, from high to low, and then all over, and then they come down, and now they kind of center at 4 hertz. So that was, they called, was brainwave entrainment, and entrained your brainwaves to a certain thing. Well, that's what it does. And Bob had this one thing that was kind of evidential in his out-of-body, is that he would feel like a pulsation in his body, and he... He timed it as best he could and said it was about four hertz. So we thought, well, why not? We were into trying anything. You know, we, we had no clue what we were doing or what would work. So we just were trying everything. So we did that. We put on the binaural beat and we listened to it and we put it at four hertz because that's, that's where Bob was oscillating right there. Now, why? Did all that go together? We didn't know, but it just seemed like a good thing to do. So it was maybe intuitive or maybe it was just luck. So we put the binaural beat on at 4 hertz, and sure enough, puts you into a theta state. And then we find out later that that theta state is exactly the place where people who've been meditating for a long time, their EEG energy settles down to that theta state. You know, So you go get some monks out of a monastery someplace and wire them up with the EEG, and you'll find before... Before you know, they, they start meditating, their brainwaves are like everybody else. And then after they meditate, all down here at 4 hertz. So, and if they had, were new, it wasn't nearly as strong as if they had been meditating a long time. You know, the, the old monks that were really good at it, they really narrowed down to, you know, to just, just a couple of frequencies in that, in that pulse. And so we figured, well, that's good. You know, meditation, that's kind of how you... Get these altered states. It's a good idea. Four hertz. That's what Bob felt was that vibration. And we indeed had also felt the four hertz vibration because by then we had also been able to just do that on our own through meditation. And, you know, the, that four hertz beat was, was a signpost for us that we were at the right place. So we started uh, playing with the binaural beats, different bass frequencies, different ways. You know, we tried sine waves and you know, triangle waves and all kinds of things to see if we couldn't optimize it. And we finally got a, you know, a set of binaural beats that were optimal. Bob wasn't even there then. He was given a course someplace in California. He was gone for a couple of weeks. When he came back, we had already had an optimized uh, binaural beat for him, and he really liked it. And then we started bringing people in, just people off the street, and saying, here, just listen to this and tell us what happens. You know, and a lot of them just, you know, went out uh, into amazing spaces, and some just fell asleep. Uh, but it affected everybody almost. And then we had some monks come through. Can't remember. I think they may have been Tibetan on some sort of tour or whatever, and they heard a Bob and Rose, so they stopped and and uh, Bob took them all up to the lab and said, "Here, listen to our sound and see what you think of this sound." And these monks came out, and they said, "That's amazing." He said. Where that sound puts you very quickly is where it took us about 10 years 
of meditation to get to where we could do that on our own. So they were real impressed. They said, yeah, it zonks you right into the, right into the zone you want to be in and holds you there really well. And tell me, so tell we me, were at the time where was anyone else doing this? Was, but were, were binaural beats being used by anyone? No. Okay. Not that I could tell. No, we didn't see anybody else doing this. We just had this article, short article in scientific American in probably the night, late 1960s, early seventies that Dennis happened to run across and it just said binaural beats and here's what they are. And they seem to drive, uh, EEG output, mm. drive brainwaves and train brainwaves. And that's all. Nobody really knew what to do with it or anything. So it was just a curious fact that somebody had come across mm. and figuring it had something to do with the waves being created in the corpus callosum was what was, you know, the active, Thing that was going on. So in essence, so, all the videos and like content online that comes with with these binaural beats trying to assist people to meditate, sleep, etc. It's technically coming from you guys in a sense. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty cool. much. Yeah, we yeah, we started it and it got to be such a big deal that a lot of people started doing it. Because um, it's it's there's does there's content everywhere regarding that that mm -hmm. content. Yeah, I have I have my own binaural beats that uh if you go to my website, you can find them. You know, I, I don't, they don't cost very much, you know, $25, $30 or something. You get a whole bunch of them and uh, all kinds of different bass frequencies because different people relate better to different bass frequencies. So it's just out of my, you know, 40 years experience with them, I kind of put these together as, as optimal and uh, they work really well. Everybody that listens to them, they almost always just zip into a, meditation state very quickly and it holds in there every once in a while one out of maybe two or three hundred people really just doesn't like them <laughs> they have a problem with them i think they're afraid i think they have a fear that this is some going to do something to them it doesn't do anything to you it gives you an opportunity to have experiences like you've been meditating for a decade but it doesn't you know there's no residual effect or anything that happens. So it's not a, it's not a scary thing, but some people just don't like it, but they're very, very few. Not almost everybody does like it very much. I'll put a link to that down below. Tom, I get once again, I mean, it's, it's, it's so incredible to hear these stories. I mean, that's a pretty, that's, that's such a big deal because you know how much people use these nowadays and it's such a profound mm -hmm. tool for a lot of people. So I can imagine, I will definitely put a link to that below. Once again, Tom, thanks so much. It's, it's, it's been such an incredible journey. Again, because it's past midnight, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to give you my worst version. So I'd rather us cut and then follow up again with the round three and then touch on sp specific aspects because what I'm, what I'm thinking would be a great idea moving forward would be I tailor a bunch of questions, curate a whole bunch of perhaps counter arguments, questions and concerns regarding the theory of everything. And then we go through a whole round just discussing all of those. What do you think about that? Oh, sure. That's fine. Mm. That's fine. Mostly I find that you know, the, the, this concept of, of reality that I have, mm. you know, it solves, it solves the, uh, the physics problem with, you know, how does quantum mechanics work? You know, it solves that problem and it solves a lot of other problems too, but the physicists, aren't too interested because it's not material. You know, it's not, they want a materialist theory that solves their problem, not some other problem, which they don't give much credence in the, and I think the uh, irony uh, is that you are a physicist. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I don't know. But anyway, it's not, it's not that hard to understand. I mean, I just gave a, what a 20 minutes. I gave the whole overview of it hmm. just today, but, so anybody can understand that, but it, that's not really understanding it. That's like intellectually getting some of it. You have to really, one, you have to do it. You have to be it. You have to do these paranormal things and realize that, you know, just like I did when I was reading that stuff and I found out that, you know, these lines were the ones, and it turned out those were exactly the cars that were the problem. And I fixed all that and it ran. And I started using that. You know, every time, you know, I'm making change and changing cards and 
you know, that was my way of doing things. And I was much faster at finding errors than anybody else, you know, but it wasn't because I was cleverer than anybody else. I just had this trick that was using my intuitive side to come up with that. But anyhow, it's a, it's a simple enough idea. And once you understand it, so simple that suddenly everything, all the questions you have about how things work and what's going on, they just all fall out. The simple explanations, elegant explanations for all of them. But even though in 20 minutes, 23 minutes, I could explain it, that doesn't help anybody understand it. You can get that explanation and you still don't have a clue what's going on. You, it takes most people at least four or five months of actively thinking about it, yes. trying to trying to justify in their mind how it works, you know. And that's a struggle because everything in your life, all of your culture tells you that that's not right. That's not the way the world works. You've got this bias toward materialism, not because somebody taught a course on materialism, but because it's just your culture. That's part of our collective consciousness. You take that in and you can't help it, you know. So you look at it and you say, oh, here's a problem. Okay, here's a problem. And it doesn't do this. Blah, blah. But the problem is that what you're doing is you're coming with an assumption based on materialism and you're seeing that that doesn't work. And you're right, that doesn't work. But that's not what the model's about. You just interpret it that way because that's where your patterns all go to. They go to materialism for for things like how do things work. So it, that's what makes it hard. It's not that the concepts are, the concepts simple and easy, but to, until, to get it to where you own it and you really understand it, one, you need to apply it. You need to apply it, show yourself that this paranormal stuff actually is real. Don't believe me, that won't get you anywhere. Believing me is, is irrelevant. You have to go do it. You know, that's why I've made tools at my, you know, in my website, you can find tools for doing that. But so one, you have to get into it to enough that you can do it. That's not that hard. You can do paranormal things. Not, they're not that hard to do. They're not like you have to work for, you know, 20 years to, to do that. To, you just have to get rid of your beliefs, all of your beliefs, start fresh and just try a little bit and you'll see they'll fall out. What you're doing is developing your intuitive side a little bit. And the hard thing will be getting your intellectual side to sit down and leave you alone because it'll always want to jump in to the process because it's dominant. Your intellectual side is like this powerful and your intuitive side is like, you know, that powerful. And that intellect always wants to jump in and fix it. So that would be the problem. So I find that people, it takes them years before they really get it. That's why I actually understand love, it. I love this idea of podcasts nowadays because just having these long form discussions, particularly this type of long form discussion, for me personally, has been very helpful to to allowing myself to expose myself to certain theories, understandings of reality. Because as I said the last time, I mean, if this was twenty years ago, ten years ago, I would never even be able to have this conversation with someone. Yes, who's an idealist. In, in general, it would have just been completely over the head, uh, top of the head for me. It would have been absurd, bizarre, uh, completely crazy. Mm -hmm. but, but once you understand oh. those, those you, it's, it's, as I said before, it's micro steps. You've got to take it slowly, take it in doses. Balance yeah. is, is key. It takes time. Mm -hmm. So it actually takes a couple of years before you get comfortable with it, that you just think in those terms and everything makes sense. You know, all those things that didn't make sense before just make sense. And that takes a long time. So it's not an easy thing to explain to somebody. Okay, 23 minutes, I can kind of give a hands over, but that doesn't help. They don't understand it. They have no idea because they have all these beliefs that run counter to it. And those beliefs just get in the way. And they'll find a, a hundred critical problems with it. But every critical problem ought to be their assumption of some kind of material thing yes. and they can't help it i mean they know that that's a problem they're aware of that's a problem but they can't get past it because it's just innate to them to think that way so that's the problem is 
it's a simple thing, but it's a really difficult thing that you're going to have to work for before you get it because it is just so counter to the way you think and to what you believe that it, you just have to work through all of that belief and discard it, and that's hard to do. You just don't rip your beliefs up because you think you want to. Yeah, you know, it's, it's I think a it, difficult thing to do. In this case, Tom, I think the benefit would be is well, me hosting this show, though, as opposed to a random question generator. The nice thing is I'll be able to curate those those questions and and sort of sift through the ones who are unable to do that. Get some of those questions that do have that skeptical element because of the materialism, because it will help the conversation flow. But the mm -hmm. nice thing will be is that I'll actually tailor it according to those who are curious beyond the material and, and, and hopefully have another wonderful discussion because it's, it's always a fascinating journey for me. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. You know, and I think it's good if you, if you can uh, keep enough of your people interested long enough for them to actually get it, then that will be, that will be good. But you know, if even only two or three people get it, that's good too. Yeah. You know, it's 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 not it's not like you have to make everybody see it. Well, Some quantity people just quantity. Sometimes you just gotta you gotta get those those red gems on involved. And then I've got something coming out uh, that you'll probably see in a, another three or four weeks. Uh, I've got something coming out in a couple of weeks that is uh, it's not long. It's only about twenty minutes. So it's something that people can actually watch, and it gives a history of kind of qu of physics, kind of a you know a, a physics history, kind of philosophy, a science kind of thing, and it looks at the quantum quantum physics and starts in the 1920s, where or 1915 and 1925 in that that uh, decade, where quantum theory was coming together and what physics did with that, and and kind of through the process up to today. And it's, uh, so I think that's pretty right, interesting. Like Copenhagen interpretation, you're going to go through that whole journey. Yeah. Because, yeah, awesome. you know, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but <clears throat> what my, what, what my uh, derivation, you know, I said that I, der I derive physics. What I get is the Copenhagen results. That's what I get. So my model says Copenhagen results were the real results. They were absolutely right. You didn't but say this on this is, podcast, but I have I have seen you say that before. Yeah, but the but science, uh, quantum physics has kind of gotten away from that because the Copenhagen results were too woo woo. There was too much stuff there, then the consciousness was a problem, and so they wanted to get away from that. So you can see the steps that they took and and the process they made to 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 kind of slip away from Copenhagen because Copenhagen was embarrassing, mm -hmm. but all these people. You know, asking them questions about, well, what does consciousness have to do with it? And they just didn't know the answers. And they didn't like the answers. They wanted it to be materialism that was straightforward, you know, uh, materialism. And they weren't able to do that. So, anyhow, they did throw away Copenhagen. Copenhagen is not uh, in high regard anymore. That's That's been thrown out. So my little talk is about all the history of that. Awesome. and how that worked and where it is and so on. And I, I think your people would probably find that to be interesting. So in about, actually, I've got it done, and I already have the video, but I'm going to have some kind of an event in a couple of weeks, and I want to kind of do the, the, the first showing there, you know, with the, and then after that, it'll go up on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes. What is it? As Tom, is it like a documentary? Or is it a huge giving lecture series? What, what is it's it? Me, it's me talking. Okay. No, nice. I have some, I have, I have some slides. So it's not just talking head. There's some slides to it, and uh, it's just me talking, explaining that century. Okay. You know what? What did that century from you know 1915 to 1920 to 2015 to you know 2020, 2025? We're not quite a century entirely away from that. What did that? How did physics evolve throughout that? throughout that century and why, where did it, where did it go? I'll definitely put a so link it, in this video as well. Once, once. Yeah, I think you, I think you'll find that to be very interesting because they will see the, once you understand that story, then it will be easier for you to let go of materialism because yes. you'll kind of see where the, you know, where, where it went wrong and, and uh, oh, you'll definitely. see also some of, some of the successes of the, 
of the, uh, I give a whole list of long successes, which are paradoxes that got answered, you know, by, by this, this theory that otherwise don't have any answers. You know, they're just mysteries. So it's a, I think it, it, it's not that deep and it's, most people will get it right away. And it's only 20 minutes long, so it's a good intro ah. to this to this subject. Now you're digging a lot deeper into it mm-hmm. with our with our talk, but this is a good introduction. I think it'll be. People. I think they'll enjoy it. I think that sounds like a wonderful concept as well. And yeah. I'll definitely have a link to that. Thanks again, Tom. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time always. Uh, you're welcome, Dev. It's uh, I enjoy talking with you. And I appreciate you, your time, too, because you're going to spread this out and hopefully we'll get some people to yeah, get, a bigger, get a bigger picture. I think the world needs it. <laughs> <laughs>